Okay, you are live. Good afternoon, I'm Vice Mayor Shanika Smith and Chair of the Public Safety Committee. I'd like to welcome you to our June 1st meeting. This meeting was originally scheduled for May 25th, but was rescheduled to today due to technical difficulties. We appreciate everyone's patience. All council members and staff are participating virtually. To help our audience follow along, I'll state each section of the agenda aloud. We are streaming live on our virtual engagement hub, which is accessible through the virtual engagement hub link on the front page of the city website. We also have the option for the public to listen live by phone by dialing 855-925-2801 and entering the code 9477. For today's meeting, we have the option for people to call in and comment live during the meeting. To call in and comment live, use the same number 855-925-2801, meeting code 9477. Your phone will be muted and you will hear the meeting live. At this point, callers will, will hear four more options. Please press star three. Pressing star three will allow callers to continue to listen live and join a speaker queue. As stated on the agenda, public comment will now be heard at the beginning and the end of the public safety meeting. Callers may call only once during the general public comment sessions, either during the beginning or the end of public the public comment period, but not both. We will take public comment for 30 minutes during each of these comment periods. Callers will have three minutes each. We will be taking public comment after council and staff introductions on today. So if you would like to comment, make a comment, please join the speaker queue by pressing star three. If you are watching the meeting through the live stream while you are listening to the meeting by phone, please be sure to turn down the volume on your device before speaking. I will now go through and introduce all committee members and staff who are participating virtually. Please, please make sure that you keep your microphone muted if you are not speaking. Council and staff, as I call your name, please say a quick hello. Councilwoman Kilgore. Hello. Councilwoman Kim Roney. Hello. City Manager Deborah Campbell. Hello. City Attorney Brad Branham. Hello, everyone. Police Chief David Zach. Good afternoon. Fire Chief Scott Burnett. All right, I think he's with us though. Maybe, maybe he stepped away. Development Services Director Ben Woody. Hello and good afternoon. Development Process Coordinator Claire Richardson Friedman. Hello, good afternoon. APD Administrative Services Manager Dan Limley. Hello. All right, as I just mentioned, we will start the agenda with public comment. If you are commenting through the live speaker queue, please say your name and where you reside. You'll have three minutes to comment. Staff, we ready? Yes, um, I'll bring the first caller in now and I will let you know when we reach um, the last caller or 30 minutes, whichever comes first. Okay, thank you. And Vice Mayor, I apologize. I had muted myself earlier, I'm here. Oh, no problem, how are you? I'm good, thank you, sorry. and most of the 100 plus residents I'm representing have chosen to live downtown. I'm here to celebrate Asheville as one of the top 10 Miller, music cities sorry, in the US. I'm sorry, start over? We missed the first part of that. Okay, <laughs> should, should I start now? Are yep. you ready? Yep. Okay. okay, my name is Susan Griffin and music is one of the reasons I and most of the 100 plus residents I'm representing have chosen to live downtown. I'm here to celebrate Asheville as one of the top 10 music cities in the US. Yet there are some who those, of those who wanna paint us as some evil other, you know, those people who are trying to shut down music in Asheville. Nope, 
We're some of the many Ashevillians who wholeheartedly support the local music scene. We go to shows, we buy local, we stay local. We're not anti-music. So what are we supposedly against? It's certainly not the existing pre-COVID music scene, the one that gave us our top 10 listing. It is very simply the public health issue created by excessive noise, not addressed in the proposed noise ordinance correctly. The sound exceedance and requested frequency of events are not to support local musicians. It's to support bigger touring groups. It's to bring in bigger crowds. It will test the city's capacity to keep the public safe with a greatly reduced police force. And it will test the limits of livability with noise levels at our homes that reach OSHA's danger zone, 85 decibels. That's a recognized health issue for all the public. Excessive noise contributes to diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, sleep disturbance, depression, stress, as well as hearing loss. This isn't some wealthy condo owner's issue. The city recently purchased the property directly adjacent to downtown's only outdoor performance venue with the intention of building affordable housing there. The proposed sound exceedance of 85 decibels at all our homes is simply too much. Try to imagine a running gas-powered leaf blower next to your head while you talk to someone on the phone or watch TV or have a conversation. That's what you're asking us to endure in our homes. And the comparison of 85 decibels to a leaf blower is not an exaggeration. It's a recognized CDC decibel equivalent. Additionally, cities with loud entertainment districts have seen residents in those areas convert their homes to short-term rentals as they're no longer conducive to everyday living. This city correctly decries STRs as a major contributor to high housing costs, but this ordinance sets up downtown for little else on a much faster and more uncontrollable tra trajectory than you can imagine. Asheville is music and mountains and art and beer, but mostly it is about the people here, those who love this city and have chosen to make it their own. We celebrate local. If you want Austin, go to Austin or Nashville or New Orleans. But if you want Asheville, let's remember what makes us so special. Let's remember why we attract so many tourists and why we became a top 10 music city in the first place. Why are we trying to compete with these other cities when we're really good at being ourselves? The guiding principles listed in the beginning of today's presentation recognize excessive noise as a public health, welfare, and safety hazard and acknowledge the community's right to an environment free from excessive noise that may degrade their quality of life or diminish property values. We ask that you live up to those principles as you debate if this ordinance is truly ready to send on to council. Thank you. health and one aspect of that work has been Caller, measuring we, um, exposure. Can you start over? Uh, we missed the first part of that. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Um, we all set? Yes. We uh, my name is Bob. I've lived in downtown Asheville for approximately 10 years and uh, I live here full time. Um, I've worked for about 35 years as a professional in occupational health. And one aspect of that work has been to measure noise exposures in the work workplace and evaluate risk to those exposures and from those exposures. I've also done some consulting work um, with towns in the Northeast um, regarding enforcement of their noise ordinances. Um, so what about our proposed noise ordinance? First, I think it's great that uh, the city is attempting to move towards objective criteria, uh, establishing sound limits. Um, this will greatly increase the ease of enforcement as opposed to the current subjective test. Um, However, in reading through the ordinance, um, it seems like we've adopted a hybrid approach. Some districts have objective criteria. Uh, one, the big one, residences uh, does not. It remains uh, tied to a subjective test for enforcement. 
um, strongly encourage you to make the entire ordinance objective. Um, I think as long as the ordinance contains meaningful and sound criteria, um, it will be effective and enforceable. Um, I also want to touch on um, the sound exceedance limit, which would provide an exception to these standards uh, by allowing essentially the music industry to um, expose residences to up to 85 dB uh, of noise up to 12 hours a day and for something like 20 to 30 days per year. As the first speaker said, um, this is the occupational noise st standard throughout the world. Um, the fact that it even appears in a community noise ordinance is really absurd. Um, it does present some risk of hearing loss. Um, now, Charlotte and Austin, in their noise ordinances, both Where use- Where are you at? Three minutes. Both use 85 dB. Caller ending in 5200, your line is open. Hello, can y'all hear me? We can hear you, thank you. Excellent. Everyone wants to talk about the ordinances. I'm gonna talk about something else. I grew up in an abusive household with a military father, so I have intimate understanding of the psychology of authority figures drunk on power and violence. Whenever someone caught a beating in my house, there was always a time after when everyone would walk around in eggshells pretending nothing happened. It's a similar pattern of abuse now at work with the way the city of Asheville has handled the investigation into last year's protest in the wake of George Floyd's death. APD literally dropped a 300 page report just hours before this committee met back in March and then the city canceled the April meeting. So I find it fitting this meeting falls right on the anniversary of the day APD was gearing up to brutalize its citizens. It seems no one wants to talk about what happened. Part of the sham investigation was supposed to include an element of public participation so the community could tell its side of the story. I know Chairman Smith has asked the city manager about that multiple times now to no avail. I mean, this committee even went so far as to block testimony from the attorney representing over 20 people who filed use of force complaints against APD. So if y'all aren't gonna talk about what happened, I will. This investigation came in two parts. The first internal, internal review by the city attorney showed that Ms. Campbell, who we pay a quarter of a million dollars to, completely abdicated her role as chief conservator of peace within the city and told the chief of police he had car, car blanche to do whatever necessary to keep people safe, which is ironic in light of all the people hurt by police munitions and the destruction of a medic station, which continues to bring international ridicule as seen as recently as in The Guardian this week. We all know there was neither an all hazard plan or an incident action plan in place, which is odd because manager Campbell has been through similar protests in the wake of the Keith Lamont shooting in Charlotte. She might've actually been able to tell APD that protesters were likely to take to the interstate and y'all could have managed those protests accordingly. I just wanna point out to the citizens of Asheville that when things really hit the fan, the only adult in charge was some hired muscle who'd been in town for probably like three months, who if you dropped off in the middle of Kenilworth, wouldn't even be able to find his way out of the neighborhood. So let's get to that. As to the chief's leadership, the second phase of this investigation, their own internal review, revealed by my count around 10 violations of APD internal policies, including Failure to record interagency radio traffic. Failure to have gr grenaders activate their body-worn cameras. Failure to have officers who use less than lethal weapons complete use of force reports. <laughs> Failure to keep track of what munitions were used. Failure to keep track of other agencies and departments' participation in those protests. Everyone knows they...
Nope. Caller ending in 2266, your line is open. Caller ending in 2266, your line is open. Hi, this is Grant Millen. <laughs> I had a, I'm switching my meeting. I uh, specified that I wanted to speak at the public comment period at the end of the meeting. That's what I'm planning on doing. Okay, um, if you wanna hang up and then rejoin the speaker queue, um, we'll bring you in at the end comment period. Okay, thank you. Caller ending in 2559, your line is open. Uh, good afternoon, Council. Um, I appreciate your time. Um, I have uh, lived and worked in Asheville for over 10 years in the entertainment industry. Um, and I just want to put my, um, you know, efforts behind the, the AMP coalition and the common sense guidelines that they've been backing for any sort of noise ordinance. Um, you know, as far as identifying <clears throat> with the spirit of Asheville, um, sitting on my porch on French Broad Avenue and hearing, uh, you know, the booms of a tourist game um, or downtown after five in the distance uh, has always, you know, left a, a good place in my heart. And I continue to hope to continue to hear music in the air in Asheville. Um, so, yes, I support some common sense regulations respecting all res residences and businesses. And I appreciate your time. Caller ending in 6939, your line is open. Hello, the council and everybody else on this call. My name is Josh Blake. I'm a musician and producer and engineer who's been living in Asheville since 1997. And uh, I wanted to address the new noise, proposed noise ordinance today. Because um, as written, I believe it would be detrimental to the music industry in this town. And I'm reacting to it here in several capacities. Number one is a musician who makes a living off of playing shows. Uh, the founding member of Asheville Music Professionals, a nonprofit that's been serving the music industry here for the last five years. As the owner of Independent Arts and Music of Asheville, a web channel that has promoted Asheville's music scene since 2012 with over 250,000 monthly viewers. As a CVB Partner of the Year in 2016, as I helped them shape their Asheville as a Music Destination campaign. Uh, as the director of the Asheville All-Star Show for Downtown After Five, as a friend and ally to all my music venue owning friends and uh, people who work there, and as a music fan who enjoys the developed, uh, what we've developed here culturally, and as a father who chose to raise his children in a city with a vibrant music and arts community. And I'll start by saying I believe I can speak for the music industry as a whole when I say we wish to be good neighbors and proud contributors to our city. I can say as a touring musician that I've seen the music scenes all over this country and the one we've created here in Asheville is truly unique and special. I've never taken that for granted. And I hope in regards to this ordinance, ordinance, the city won't either. And as it's written, the new noise ordinance would be absolutely detrimental to the lifeblood of the music scene in this town. The decibel levels noted are, and proposed are unrealistic and the requirements and punishments for venue owners in violation are absolutely unreasonable and excessive. Um, <clears throat> there are some venues that have been downtown for 30 years. Does that mean they now need to cater to the influx of new residents? The most inappropriate part of this ordinance is the requirement for venue to close its doors for 30 days after a second violation. The music industry in this town is a huge economic driver, bringing in over $170 million annually. This alone should be a testament to the fact that closing a venue for 30 days would have a ripple effect that is unwarranted. A staff gets temporarily laid off. Musicians who had gigs are out of work. Vendors who sell things at the venue are out a month's worth of revenue. And the surrounding restaurants, shops, and hotels all suffer because of this. The city cannot allow residents to move into an urban area then complain their way into shutting down businesses that were there before them. There are several venues and events that have helped shape our city's vibrant nightlife, one that is sought after by visitors all over the globe. They should be considered protected, not, not um, something that we need to be limiting. <clears throat> and the limit of the events 
there's a limit of events in this ordinance. It's also unreasonable for people who've built their businesses off of them. There should be no limits to the number of events a venue or event can have so long as they're being good neighbors. There are no conditions in this ordinance for... There's no conditions in this ordinance for chronic complainers. Caller ending in 1547, your line is open. Hello, my name is Michael Martinez. I'm a musician in town. Uh, I've been calling in to your guys' meetings now for about a year and a half. Um, for a variety of reasons. And I think that this is just as worthy of a phone call as the rest of them. I make most of my living off of music in Asheville. I have been, since I moved to this place 13 years ago to play music. I visited Asheville once and saw the music scene here and decided that this is where my home was, that this is where I can grow as a human and also, as Mr. Blake said in the previous message, and be a good neighbor. And I think I've done that. And I think that I've, you know, made an effort to uh, to really build, help build the music community here um, as if I were from here, because I respect the culture that was built here before me. And I think that this ordinance will not only, you know, vastly affect me as a musician and producer who owns a studio in Asheville who has gotten national press as a band for Asheville who has done a lot to help grow this city into what it is. I think that this ordinance spits in all of our faces. I think that it's unacceptable to cave to white shoebies, which are rich tourists that own vacation homes in Asheville as opposed to the community that has been here for long before me. And that I think that it would be a shame to see the city ruin that. And I think that that's exactly what this would do because I wouldn't want to live here anymore. And I know plenty of people who make, as Josh said, $170 million, you know, is the revenue that the music industry brings here. And, you know, what, what, what is, what does that look like if, if people can't do what they can, what, what their profession is in this town, you know, um, I think that you guys all have a duty to, you know, commit to the people that have been here and not rich white tourists who own houses in Asheville, which is the majority of the complainers. And I appreciate you all for listening. I hope you do something right. You know, I've been asked, I've been saying this at the end of most of my calls, but, you know, I really wish Deborah Campbell would resign. Thanks. Caller ending in 3318. Your line is open. Hi, uh, my name is Alyssa Deroni. I live in Woodson. I've been here for eight years. And um, I'm not a musician, but one of the first times we visited, we saw the drum circle. And um, it's one of the first things we mention to people when they uh, visit. It's like, go check out this drum circle. And I apologize, I haven't had time to read over in detail of the noise ordinance. I just recently heard about it. So um, if I'm speaking to things that aren't going to be affected, then please forgive that. But what I wanted to bring up was a little memory I had of actually New Orleans and a vacation I took. And so my friend and I visited and we had all these plans and we did those plans. But one of my best memories was something that wasn't planned. And we were just outside of the city and we were walking home and it was probably, I don't know, 11 o'clock at night. And there was this brass band on the street, on the corner. And it was a group of about five to 10 young men just, you could tell they were so passionate and it was, you could just feel that that was what they were living for. And there was a crowd that gathered. It was pretty big but because it was just such an awesome scene. I mean, the cars that went by were honking and it was just in, in a happy way and it was beautiful. And 
had there been a noise ordinance in that town that ended sound before then, um, I don't think that this memory would have occurred. And I do think that Asheville is in a way like a little tiny baby New Orleans, and I would love to see it uh, move more in that direction. And taking something, putting something like a noise ordinance on this town just, just feels wrong on so many levels because it's such a piece of our culture here and um, it brings a vibrancy and a flavor to this town that makes it different from other cities. And the last thing I think we want is for Asheville to become just like every other city. And that's all I got. That was our last caller. All right, that concludes public comment. I'll go on to um, ask for a motion for the approval of the minutes. This is Kim, so moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, I'll do a roll call vote for the approval of the motion. Um, Councilwoman Kilgore? Yay. Okay, Councilwoman Roney? Yay. Okay, and myself, I. Um, and minutes approved. The next item on our agenda will be um, the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area Grant, and Chief David Zach will start us off with that. Hi, Chief. How are you? Good afternoon, Vice Mayor, uh, members of council and city staff. Joining me here today is uh, Deputy Chief Bomb Stark and Deputy Chief Yelton. Uh, we are presenting on several issues today, uh, but first on our agenda is the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area Program. Uh, while I am very familiar with this program, I thought it best so we could uh, have a clear understanding of what the of all things the program does, uh, we brought in the experts. So joining us here uh, to present uh, on, on this portion is Donald Hansen, and he is the Deputy Director for the Atlanta Carolinas Haida. So, Don, are you are you there? I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Thanks for having me. Go ahead, Don. Okay. Well, uh, City Council, thanks for having me here today. If you have any questions when I go through this, by all means, just jump in and ask. I tend to go quick. Uh, but it's important that uh, I give you a good flavor of what the Haida program is and what it is not. Um, so to start off, what is Haida? Haida is a grant program. It's a reimbursable grant that is administered by the Office of National Drug Control, Control Policy, ONDCP. And it was formed to uh, battle narcotics in the 90s. I mean, that's really what it was formed. But it was formed so that we could uh, put together federal, state, and local task forces that were in areas that were having significant issues with drug trafficking. And then they have um, other er areas that they are related to. That's important. I'll get into that a little bit more, how uh, certain areas become a Haida. But it was about really battling the, dr the major narcotics, uh, distribution of narcotics throughout our, our uh, counties in certain areas. Go on one more. So what Haida does, it comes in to support, as I mentioned, a pre-established enforcement program. In our case, uh, throughout North Carolina, we have uh, Drug Enforcement Administration task forces already that are in operation. And we join with them because they have all the infrastructure you need, all the organization you need to conduct in investigations at the highest level. Uh, a big part of uh, what we do is training. Uh, obviously, we look to professionalize our enforcement operations. We, we continue to train both those that are involved in our task forces and those that are involved in policing at all levels. You can always go on to the Atlanta Carolinas Haida website and you see the type of training we offer, which is the gamut. And it's about training people to be leaders and to train people to do the job the way that uh, we all expect is in our communities. Big, also a large part of what we do in intelligence and information sharing and deconfliction. Um, obviously, you can see that why that's important, and uh, that's a big part of what we what we do in each of our height, especially here in in the Atlanta Carolinas. Obviously, going with that is the task force management and support. We also have treatment and prevention uh, programs. 
Uh, that is not what this funding is for because that's a different side of Haida, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But this 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 particular funding stream is for the enforcement programs, although I will say out of Atlanta, we do have a prevention program that we call upon. And then out of the big Haida, meaning, you know, throughout the nation, we call on some other uh, that you might have heard of the drug overdose um response uh, initiatives we have nationally. And I'll just talk a little bit about that. If you have questions, I can answer those. On to the next. So it's important to understand again that this is a, when you become a Haida, obviously we have uh, narcotics issues throughout the country. Uh, the, the difference here is the amount of narcotics, the amount of uh, distribution, and the levels maybe of the violence that go with some of these uh, organizations that you set up a, a threat assessment. So this is something where um, we have uh, people from the Atlantic Carolinas in our particular instance in Asheville, for example, had to go out to all the different areas there. They went through the cases, they went through the violence, the impact it was making on our communities. And then they went and compared how that was also hitting other Haida areas, maybe at the border in Charlotte, or even up in the Northeast. And they find that there's a significant impact between these areas. Those are the ones that are designated. Not everybody's designated. And the reason is because there's a, a multitude of issues that show when they go through this threat assessment. Another big thing is uh, the, it, your local uh, law enforcement has to already be doing things to combat these issues so that we can support them. So the pre-existing drug task forces are very, very important. They're instrumental in us setting up a HIDA program because again, it has the infrastructure. We have the identity. We were able to identify these groups at the highest levels so that we can take out the organizations that are impacting our people, our communities. Uh, and that's a big, big plus for the HIDA uh, operations. Another thing to definitely understand is that uh, this is an increase in, in federal allocation that goes to the HIDA program to support the task force. There's no other. They have to spend the money on the task force and then they go. It's a reimbursable grant for that money for the task force. Uh, another thing to also understand is this threat assessment goes all the way up through the office of the president at ONDCP. Uh, a lot of people review it before it gets there, important people before it gets to that point, and including um, significant representatives for the state, because obviously this is something that everybody needs to organize and be involved with uh, at all levels. Again, federal, state, and uh, local. And, and for us in Asheville, uh, the, the tribal areas as well, which is very significant. On to the next. This just gives you a little flavor for how we look across the country. I mentioned Haida's and, you know, each Haida is a little different because we're in the Atlantic Carolinas Haida. Uh, the, there are obviously Haida's throughout the country. They operate a little differently. Uh, as I mentioned, we are very, uh, we have the DEA task forces. We operate through, not all areas do that. And other Haida's are much bigger. So they have other programs that include, you know, straight out treatment and other sides of their program that we don't have yet. I mean, it, there's obviously new changes coming in with the new administration, but currently uh, we have a prevention. We don't have a treatment side. On to the next. So like, let's talk about a little bit specifics here about Asheville. Uh, the Asheville Police Department is part of the HIDA. Uh, we have 34 designated uh, counties within uh, and five of the eastern band of Cherokee Nation areas uh, for our North Carolina, our, for our Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina HIDA. Uh, we are probably what you would consider about an average size HIDA. Uh, in North Carolina specifically, where we have initiatives in Asheville, we have Piedmont, the Charlotte area the triad in Greensboro and the triangle in Raleigh. Uh, those are our major operation areas where we have um, task forces that we support, not only just in Asheville, but if we drill down a little further, if you go on to the next one, um, so that, you know, you remember I mentioned that these task forces were pre-existing. So DEA had set up partnerships with other mem members of, uh, of the, um, whether it's the Sheriff's Department, the, uh, the police departments, the Bureau of um, Indian Affairs, SBI, State Highway Patrol, we basically look to bring all those groups together, again, to work these cases at the highest levels we can get. You need those type of resources where people are counting on one another for both investigative uh, 
leads and also to be able to coordinate with other areas because these things are very labor intensive, these cases. Um, so what we do at Haida is we look for opportunities to fund at those levels. Again, to fund those cases, they're gonna need more resources where they need to attack these groups that are causing the biggest issues in our areas uh, that we've, we're basically targeting. It's a, it's a 100% reimbursement uh, program. Basically what happens is in the task force, they'll spend money. Ask will be will be the uh, um, the organization that will will use their rules. They'll act as a fiduciary in that instance. They'll pay the bills, and then we the HIDA program pays those bills back after they they've already paid them out. It's a reimbursable grant, so that includes you know some overtime and some of the other things we have to do on the, as case needs. Off to the next. The total grant amount is 275,416. That includes the tribal areas as well. Uh, again, it doesn't go into APD's budgets. It's a separate, separate line item, and it's followed both from the Atlanta Carolinas into um, into the what's called uh, the NHAC. It's the it's the support organization for our HIDAs, and then again all the way to ONDCP. The budget grants the the actual form the 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 one that the city that you will sign comes from ONDCP. And again, they, they APD supports the, the task force uh, in their purchase of equipment and evidence or whatever their other things are gonna need uh, as the case moves on. Next. So I mentioned the type of cases, I'm not gonna get into a lot of it. Time uh, is of essence in, in some senses, but you can, You'd be very proud of this task force in the sense that they are really attacking some of the things that are, you know, we all are struggling with, with the opioids and the other uh, issues we're having. Um, and if you go on to the next slide, this is an example of the type of things they do. And all that looks great, but what I look at right away is that 23 kilograms of fentanyl. The dangers to our community uh, with that type of fentanyl out there is. I mean, I don't need to explain that to anybody. I mean, that's one of the biggest struggles we're having. So we're looking for those organizations that are uh, drug trafficking organizations that are doing those type of cases where they're actually distributing that amount of narcotics and obtaining that much money. Those are the things that we're looking to do for, for uh, the community through these uh, HIDA operations. If you go on to the next, again, it's another example of significant amounts of fentanyl, methamphetamine. Obviously, we we have some issues coming back on methamphetamine, significant amount of that coming across the border. So, I mean, from the enforcement side, we've got very productive in the sense of keeping as much as we can the narcotics off the streets. Another side of what we've done with the, through Haida nationally, if you go on to the next slide, is we've worked on an overdose response strategy. It used to be called some other things, you know, it, it was the opioid response strategy, but, but understand what we figured out is that we have a, a, a number of different uh, public health issues as it pertains to narcotics. It's not just opioids only, we have a stimulant issue as well. Um, so this program offers unprecedented collaboration between law enforcement and the public health sector. Uh, and for us in North Carolina, for example, we have what's called a public health analyst and a drug intelligence officer. The public health analyst actually sits at the Department of Health here in Raleigh and does a lot of the analysis of some of the issues we're seeing uh, with overdoses, some of which if you go on to the Department of Health webpage, you can track the overdoses and that's what we do. And that analyst, the public health analyst is doing that. And uh, it's been a great partnership because, I mean, let's face it, originally in law enforcement, Department of Health, we don't always, always speak the same language, but it gives us an opportunity to get in the same room and come up with some different ideas, which is what's been happening. Uh, again, that's a discretionary funding stream. It's a different stream. It's not the one we're speaking on today, but it's important to note that um, not only ORS, but it's important to note that uh, there are programs that Hyde is developing that we as communities get to draw upon, even though they're not necessarily through, funded through exactly what we're working on. So, and another one of those is the overdose mapping program, which is near real time tracking of overdoses. And uh, we've been working on some different programs where we're trying to get EMS and some other on, people on board so that basically we can see these things happen uh, real time and respond accordingly. Um, there's a lot in one 
quick session. Do you have any questions that you have for me? I'd be glad to answer them. One question, uh, Donnie, I have is uh, like I, it's slide eight. If, can we go back to slide eight for a minute? And, and they were talking about the items that the funds can and cannot be um, used for. And I was just wondering, and it spoke about uh, even though the funds cannot be used uh, for general APD department purchases, however, overtime reimbursement and equipment and purchases for those APD employees uh, that further the task force initiatives are, are eligible. And I was just wondering, is there anything in that that sort of uh, says that what percentage must be spent directly on making an impact on that high intensity drug trafficking? Uh, is there any way to get an idea? Um, sure. Well, I, if you're speaking of what that 275,000 is percentage wide needs to go to enforcement, it's really all of it technically. However, legally through like um, policy and so forth, there's a 7% allowance for prevention, but we've already used that 7% in other programs like the OD map, the ORS. So that's a bigger national ONDCP decision. It's not like on, on my level. Um, so those, I think, I'm, I think that's what you're asking. Is there some other percentage decisions that are made? There are at the bigger levels, not when this grant is, is sent well, out. Well, more, no, more or less what I'm trying to do is actually sort of uh, get an idea if there are limitations on where that money can be used. And like I said, because if there's no limitations, if it talks about the money can be used toward overtime and, and different things that the, you know, the APD actually may need now, and as opposed to most of that money being directed to preventing the high uh, uh, trafficking drug issue that we, you know, we definitely need to address. Okay, so none of that is for APD operations. So if APD has uh, some local operations they're doing and they have they incur overtime, we don't pay for that. We pay, we simply pay for the overtime for those officers and investigators at the task force. So what happens is when we set out a budget. And each budget line item will have an overtime element, you know, equipment purchase, et cetera. We take the number of officers that are assigned to the task force and we break down each of those are allotted a certain number for overtime, but it has to be related to a case at the height. Is that what you're asking? Okay. Yeah. So all of this is based on working at the height because there are forms that go with that, right? The chief, if I work for, um, you know, the sheriff of Buncombe County Sheriff's Office, and I do overtime, I give the chief my overtime form. He signs it. He attests that he worked the overtime at the task force. Then it goes over to the task force, and they sign it saying that that task force it, member worked the task force. And it is direct. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. This is Kim. I do have a question, but True. first for the benefit of folks who are watching this, I um, did some research on the history of this funding um, and tracked it down to H.R. 5210, the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1988, which set drug-free America as a historic goal, initiated the losing war on drugs, and also restored the federal death penalty. Um, it is not mentorship, reentry programming, diversion programming, harm reduction, community-led solutions, or job training. But the high density drug traffic areas tell me that we have a high demand for economic mobility and that we need deep, not shallow investments in our community. So my question is, I just wanted to confirm that in order to be reimbursed, we have to first spend resources. Is that correct? That's correct. I have some other questions for staff. I can ask those now. Go ahead with your questions. Thank you. So um, what would we be doing instead if we don't accept the grant? I think with con considering uh, the violence that we have in this city, considering the high intensity drug trafficking we have in this city, 
uh, it would be my recommendation that we still uh, have our one detective assigned to the DEA task force to work on those large cases of manufacturing and distribution and also weapons. We would still leave that detective assigned. However, you know, as uh, Donnie brought up, you know, a two year long investigation is gonna cost a considerable amount of overtime for the personnel who are involved. I would suggest that we still keep a member of our department on that task force, but any overtime that would be incurred during those investigations would be paid solely by the city of Asheville and we would not receive the reimbursement for it. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, so filling out grants and um, all the paperwork and keeping up with them takes time, staff time. Um, do we have one person that we assign these grants to? Um, how many staff hours or how many staff members does it take for us to keep up with these grants? This particular grant, we do have a staff member assigned. Any overtime that is incurred by that person is also reimbursed by the HIDA grant. Um, and yeah, then- that, that hours I do, I do not have in front of me. I don't know that right now. I appreciate that. So with our staffing levels down, do we currently have the staff to assign to these instead of our community needs? Like, are we looking at two, five, 10 staff members? Do we have a plan? We only have uh, one detective assigned to the task force at this time. Uh, their participation is crucial, I think, to our uh, anti-violence uh, strategy here. The intelligence that we receive, the resources that they can provide as we move into some of these larger investigations, even locally, just with the violence, our participation uh, is needed, in my opinion. But again, we're only assigning one detective to that task force. We can afford to do that, again, considering the amount of information that we will receive on other investigations that are going on in the city is invaluable to us. Thank you. I think that's all the, well, there is one other question I have, and it really relates to like 1033, which we're not talking about today. But a lot of times when we're talking about grant funding, it can sound to the public like this is free money. Why would we leave free money on the table? Um, but there's a cost associated with storing and maintenance of equipment. Um, with filling out grant applications, with keeping up with grant applications, um, the cost of moving staff members to a different assignment than um, the community needs that we have. But also just name that this is personal for me. I'm losing friends and colleagues and family members to this opioid crisis and the overdose crisis. Um, I know that we need to address um, these situations at the root, um, but we did also set a goal in our retreat that we were gonna reimagine public safety and I don't see or hear yet that doing things the old way is going to result um, in less harm. I don't see where um, adding a bigger gun to the equation would mean that our young people that we've lost recently um, would still be here in our, in our community and with their families. Um, so I'm not in a position to support it at this time. Chief, I have a, um, a question comment for you. Um, um, when you were first assigned to Asheville, you uh, made a statement that you would redirect a lot of the focus of operations away from low level drug crime to the more higher intense. Um, how does this, how does this grant and the, this grant operation support that idea? And uh, yes, Vice Mayor, that's exactly what we did when we disbanded the drug suppression unit to focus on uh, the more violent crime, but also less focus on street level transactions, but go after the higher levels of, I mean, this we're, we're talking cartel level uh, activity. And, and that's what this, this task force does. And if you go back to slide 10, here's a perfect example. This is not dealing with low level street uh, trafficking. You're talking about a two year investigation where we took off, took, took in enough fentanyl that would kill the entire city. So, I mean, that's what this initiative does. Uh, confusing this or 
trying to, you know, to, to somehow think that this is, is, is going away from, from what I stated uh, some time ago, uh, they really are apples and oranges. This is, we are dealing at the highest levels of uh, distribution and manufacture of drugs, which we all know contributes to a significant amount of, the, of violence. And, and of course, we've seen an up, uptick in violence over the last four years. So this effort all goes to counter that. And again, when you're talking about that much fentanyl being seized, the guns, uh, and again, a two-year investigation, million dollars in, in drug trafficking funds. So this is what it's aimed at. It is not, you know, named it, or uh, the, the target here is not street level encounters. The target here is the main, major manufacturers and distributors of the most dangerous drugs that, uh, as Ms. Roney said, are killing too many people. And that is the role of, of our participation in this task force. So I, I just want to break this down just a, another level. Um, so it seems like the, the quantity of drugs in, in the individual's possession and the potency of, of the drug would kind of qualify it as a more higher level, more sophisticated in the food chain, so to speak. Um, would you agree with that? Donnie, you can step in on this and answer better than I do, but I would say absolutely it does. It does, but I, if you remember that the other side of this is the fact that this this particular case as well, they're connected to other areas. So that's what makes it a, a even a, um, a harder kind of case to make because you have these groups that are operating in a number of different areas. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, this one is connected to Charlotte. And then, of course, others, the source country, uh, Mexico being one of our largest these days. So it's not only the amounts, it's the sophistication of the organization, how they're transporting narcotics, major shipments of narcotics, you know, through our highways or, or however they might, most of the time for us, it's been tractor trailers or cars on the highway. So it depends on uh, the elements of the command and how they're transporting, how many areas they're hitting. Um, and in cases like this, they're hitting a number of different areas. So we have a number of different height, not only height but just different groups in different uh, geographical locations looking into the same organization because when you start getting up higher into these organizations, there are, there are leaders there and they, and those are the ones that we're looking to, to arrest and hold accountable. Okay. And, and then, but going a little lower than, than the leaders, because I'm thinking about the disproportionate amount of, um, number of blacks and Brown who are usually arrested and targeted. Um, in associating people with this high-level operation, do you all look um, to see if the individual has prior arrest, prior um, imprisonment, a history of violence, or are known to be involved with sophisticated criminal activity? And that's more mm -hmm. on an individual basis, but I'm trying to track arrest and the, 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 the usual groups of people who are targeted in this type of type and style of operation. <laughs> Well, you know, the cases when they come about, they're not targeting from any race or it's about, again, an organization. And you're absolutely right. You then begin to look at what role do the people. I mean, we get that in depth in these cases. What role does this person play in the organization? Are they a distributor? Are they organizing transportation? And then you work each part of that very specifically. I mean, it's not just random. You know, we're not just hitting places and. It, we just don't have the resources to do it like that. Um, we take our resources and we get very much in depth on who's operating vital parts of the organization because you have those that are in control of this distribution. They have those that are in control of transportation. They have those for the money. And sometimes they tend to be all organizations in amongst themselves. Is that what you're asking? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, and if there is no more discussion, um, thank you for being here with us. Okay. Today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I'm ready to call a vote. And I just wanted to add to the conversation right now that to disband this type of grant and these type of um, grant activities, I think it does put a focus on low level um, activities and low level offenders. So, you know, um, in every conversation that we've been having, 
um, lately concerning public safety, even in regard to our noise ordinance, which, which we'll hear later on, balance is very necessary um, because we still have an obligation to enforce and to pay attention to the um, the higher the, the higher trafficking, manufacturing, production of drugs. Um, but I do feel the community's um, concern when it comes to individuals and group members who are dis disproportionately targeted are affected by drug related criminal uh, criminalized activities in our community. So with that being stated, um, is there a motion to, let me go to my script. Is there a motion to approve the re re resolution to apply for and accept the 2021 HITA, HIDA grant and move forward to city council? So moved. Okay, I'll second that motion and I'll do a roll call vote for approval. Councilwoman Kilgore? Yes, approved. Councilwoman Maroney? No. And myself, I. The motion carries with a 2 1 vote. Thank you. Um, next, we have an update on APD service reduction plans. Chief Zach will present this item. Okay, thank you, Vice Mayor. But I was also asked to uh, present quickly on just some other. Uh, annual grants that APD does apply for. Uh, so I can give that briefly. Okay, thank you, go for it. Sure. Uh, these are basically the, there's four regular grants that we apply for and obviously the COVID emergency supplemental funding grant uh, was unique just to this year. But these are, are the grants that we're uh, usually applying for on an annual basis. And I'll just go real briefly what those are. Uh, next slide, please. First is the Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Grant, known as JAG. Uh, we've been receiving this grant each year since 2005. Uh, we, again, are much like the, um, the Haida grant, we're the fiduciary for us and the Buncombe County Sheriff's Office. The total amount of the grant is uh, just over 62,000. You can see the breakdown there between APD and the Sheriff's Office. We get roughly 49,000 of that. Back in 2020, those funds were used to replace rifles. Uh, our intention this year for that grant is we want to move that money. We're not going to spend any of it at all on equipment. Uh, it would be our intent to use that money to work with, with our community on strategies to increase uh, patrol coverage and, and maybe assist with other issues within the community and in our schools. So that would be the intent uh, for the money in 2021. Next, please. Uh, the Bulletproof Vest Partnership Grant. Again, we've had this, this grant every year since uh, 2000. This requires a 50-50 match. Uh, our Bulletproof Vests have a five-year lifespan, so we're constantly replacing them. So the total grant amount is 35,280. The city matches that, and that allows us, again, to uh, purchase new vests for new recruits, but also replace vests that have become worn and unserviceable. We, uh, re we reapply for that grant every June. Next, please. The Highway Safety Program uh, Bike Safe Grant. This is a very small grant. It's only $5,000. And uh, that's mostly to promote motorc motorcycle safety in North Carolina. Uh, we usually receive approval for this uh, if it's granted in late summer or early fall. Next, please. And this was the uh, COVID emergency supplemental grant. This was a one-time only grant. The only reason we were eligible for that grant is because we received JAG funds. So this year, the total grant amount uh, for that was uh, $158,000 that we received in COVID emergency uh, supplemental funding. Next, please. Before we move on, can I ask a couple of questions about the grants? Of course. Um, I think it was back on slide 16. Um, with our staffing levels down, do we have, did we use all of our funding um, that we received this past year in 2020? And if not, how much is remaining? We might not have I'm, that answer right now. Yeah, could I? 
Can I get back to you on that one, Ms. Roney? Sure. And then um, if we can go to that last slide about the COVID relief funding, have we already received this $158,000? Or is it pending? Yeah, we get it as we get reimbursed is the answer. So because it's a total grant amount of 158, what other part of our budget for public safety will be offset because of this grant? It, it doesn't offset anything. So we just have 158,000 additional dollars now in reserve? It was it was reimbursement for money we already spent. Oh, thank you for that clarification. Can you speak Sorry, to what yeah, we spent it on? I can get the breakdown, Elise. Pretty in detail. Uh, my finance person is saying it's, it's pretty detailed, but again, we'll forward that to you so you know exactly what it was. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Those are all my only questions for now. Okay, just to update the city on uh, our current levels of staffing and how that staffing is uh, affecting response times. Uh, next slide, please. Since January 2020, we've seen 82 uh, officers leave our department who represent more than or close to 450 years of cumulative experience. Uh, when we take into account the officers who've resigned, but also the officers who may be off on FMLA, uh, military leave, administrative leave, sick, injured, so forth, currently we're operating at roughly between 35 and 38% uh, down on our sworn staff on a daily basis. Next, please. This has had, uh, definitely has had a, uh, an effect on our response times. What you see here is examples of our priority calls. These are the most high risk, dangerous calls that we go on. You can see armed robberies, bomb threats, gunshots, murder, stabbings, violent domestics. Currently, because of staffing, right now it is taking us uh, 1.6 minutes longer than it used to. We're going back to May uh, when we were at full staffing, May of 2020, when we were at uh, over 238. Uh, now being down, we're seeing those response times have increased by an additional 1.6 minutes on our most serious calls. Next, please. Even more importantly, uh, when you talk about our most serious calls, because most of those calls we're not seeing after midnight. Uh, our most serious calls are usually between the hours of 0, 07 and 7 a.m. and uh, 3 p.m. And what you can see is the response time during those busier hours where you have heavier traffic and so forth. We're talking it's taking us almost three minutes longer to get to those very serious calls. And just to kind of put this in perspective a little bit, what, what that amount of time means, if you go back to March 22nd, of 2021 in Boulder, Colorado, where they had an active shooter incident in a supermarket where 10 people were killed, including the first officer on scene. The response time for that call, from the time it came into the dispatch center to the time the first officer arrived on scene was two minutes. What we're saying is for us to have gotten to a similar call, it would have taken us almost five. Uh, so we're three minutes above the time during our most busy hours. And that is an extremely long time uh, when you're talking about, you know, in progress calls of this serious in nature. So it's taking us almost over three minutes uh, longer than it used to, to get there, a significant amount of time. Next, please. Again, you can see what the uh, response times are. These are our priority one calls, not quite as serious, but still, Again, very uh, serious calls, you know, a, a shots fired call, uh, someone standing on a corner with a gun, sexual assault, fights in progress, taking us three over three and a half minutes longer to get to those calls than it did a year ago. 
Next, please. Priority two, again, less severity, uh, but again, the, the response time taking us uh, 10 minutes longer to get to those, those calls. Next. And then finally, these are our priority three calls. These are mostly service calls, uh, report calls, things like that, missing persons, vandalism, uh, breaking and entering that's not uh, in progress. For those calls, it's taking us over 38 minutes longer uh, to respond to those type of types of calls than it did back in May of 2020. Next, please. At our meeting back in February, uh, you know, we, we could see that we were going to have a problem when we knew that if we were going to try to reduce the impact of the loss of staff on uh, our ability to respond, we put a number of uh, measures in place. Just go over those real quick. Next, please. We reassigned some of our detectives to patrol, which now our detective bureau now is down roughly 50% of the detectives that we had back in May of 2020. Uh, that may have helped our response time a little bit, but it certainly will not help our clearance rate or our ability to in investigate thoroughly lower level crime. We reduced our school resource officers from five to three. Uh, we've had to assign designated report cars. We, we know some people have said it's taken us almost three, four hours in some instances to, to show up to take those reports. We had a breakdown, our number of patrol districts from four to three that would resulted in the elimination of the downtown district. And of course, now we're almost never on bike and foot patrols because we have to have our officers mobile and able to respond uh, by vehicle. Next, please. Next. Oh, oh I'm sorry, back up, <laughs> my mistake. Uh, we did open an in-person reporting office in our South Asheville uh, station using non-sworn personnel to take those complaints. We're continuing uh, to message with the public to report online through our P2C reporting tool. I, I wish that was going better than it was, but it, no matter how much we message, uh, it's still been a heavy lift to try to get people to use that tool. Uh, we've taken uh, specialized units. We've removed personnel from those units to fill in on the road, specifically detectives. You know, we're doing our best with data, trying to make sure uh, that we're closer to those locations, that statistically speaking, see a, a significant amount of violence. And again, we're just continuing to just triage our calls for service and allow calls to stack up and, and do the best we can in order to make sure that our officers are available for when those serious priority calls uh, come in. That was back in February when uh, I think we were down uh, maybe 40 officers, 50 officers, and now the number is risen to over 80. Again, 38% of staff, 35% of staff on any given day, we are going to have to implement more service cuts and basically just say, these are the things we cannot respond to at this time. So I'll just lay that out for you real quick. Next, please. A lot of these are, you know, minor type calls, reports, uh, you know, larcenies uh, with no, where there's no suspect, larcenies from vehicles, uh, minimal damage to, to personal property or graffiti, things of that nature. We can no longer even send a report card car for that. Uh, we are going to have to, uh, people will be instructed that they have to uh, file these complaints online. Obviously, if they don't have the ability to do that, uh, you know, we will send somebody out, but the message will be that th these particular crimes have to be reported online and there will be additional crimes as well. Next, please. Uh, harassing phone calls, non-threatening, uh, non-domestic related and don't involve stalking, again, reported online. Any type of fraud or identity theft, scams reported online. Simple assaults, if, if the action is, is passed 
and now you're just reporting that someone has, has, has assaulted you, again, uh, you're going to have to do that online. And just information only type reports, there's a large category of those that I, I, I really can't go into uh, time permitting. So again, all of these, we will be informing the public that they have to report online because we can no longer send an officer. Next, please. Just additional calls, lost and found property, uh, trespassing. If someone calls for us on trespass, if they are not willing to prosecute, we simply cannot uh, send an officer immediately. Uh, again, if there's violence or a major disruption, we'll send someone, but if it's low level trespass and the, uh, the business owner is not willing to prosecute, we're simply not able to send anyone. And of course, uh, you know, noise complaints. Um, and I believe, uh, Ben has a, a large presentation on that. We will still be, uh, assisting with that when, uh, Ben's crew isn't available, but again, folks have to understand our ability to get to this call. It may take us 40 minutes on an average, uh, sometimes hours if, if we're able to respond at all. So we just want to make sure that people understand, even if you call after hours, the likelihood of us getting out there while the, the complaint is still active is highly unlikely. Next, please. Again, uh, you know, where this is all going, uh, you know, hopefully that, you know, we, the loss of staff will cease and, and maybe we'll be able to get some new candidates through BLET and get them out on the street. That's still uh, many, many, many months away. Uh, we're still seeing resignations. It has slowed considerably, but it has not ceased. So, uh, you know, as we wait for, for replacements, we're just going to see response times continue to be delayed. Uh, it seems that further reductions are inevitable. We'll be very uh, careful how we do that and give it considerable thought and effort to see, you know, how can we triage better? But a big concern that we're having right now is our criminal investigations because we have lost 45 or uh, almost 50% of our detectives. And, and if you just look in the last week, uh, obviously we had the homicide at the Westville pub, over 30 shots fired in that parking lot. Uh, just this pack, past weekend, three persons had one killed. Uh, on Atkinson Street, we had sh shots into two occupied homes. Same thing on Sand Hill Road, shots into occupied homes we're investigating, armed robberies, stabbings, uh, our detective bureau right now is completely gassed out uh, with the sheer volume of investigations that that they have of serious nature that they have to address. And we will just have to triage those investigations moving forward. These officers are putting in extremely long hours, barely a weekend does, goes by where they're not called in for additional duty. Uh, and we've literally had to send them home to rest. Uh, so, Criminal investigations will continue to be triage. Training has been very, so, very difficult. Yes. I don't know what that means. Um, the investigations will be triaged. Most serious first. The most serious crimes will get the most attention. And, you know, when we start talking about, you know, minor things that we've had to investigate, I mean, and no crime is minor if you're the victim. But, you know, there's a big difference between do we have the staff to investigate homicide or, you know, we've got a bunch of vehicles broken into or vandalism in a neighborhood. Uh, you know, we, we've got to put we've, we've got to put human life first. So there there are will be things that we, we can simply cannot get to from an investigative standpoint, not with 50 percent loss of detectives. And if a person is um, is responding to uh, victimization and they are reporting it online, how soon will it be addressed? How soon will they get a call back? Again, we have to, you know, it, it's on a, Ms. Smith, it's on a day by day basis. Uh, it, it depends what came in. Oh, we had an extremely busy weekend 
this past weekend. Uh, so it, it really is dependent on the week and what the volume that came in. But obviously, we you know we want to get to everyone, but we have to be realistic on what we're able to do and what we're able not to do. And certainly, we want to get we will get back to everyone, but. Uh, th there will be delays, especially, you know, when we've got detectives working 16 hours in a row uh, on, on some of these cases. And, it, you know, you get a homicide and it's, it's not just one detective working that case. It's all of them, including our crime scene unit, who is who is maxed out as well. So we want to get back to everybody. But to, to say I can give a specific time frame when you will be contacted on the status of your investigation or who will be assigned, that's very difficult to say. And again, it will all depend on the seriousness of the incidents that we're dealing with, uh, not just that day, but maybe in, in days prior. We had uh, a day last uh, April, I believe April 16th, where we had four shootings in a single day. Everybody else got their call who, who had crimes that were committed on that day. We got back to them, but it was days later. Uh, because everyone was simply assigned to those simultaneous investigations. And, you know, this is this is what it looks like when you're down this much. When you lose 50 percent of your detectives, this is what it looks like. OK, Chief Zach, I'd like to ask you, as far as uh, if you had to say what type of percentage or increase in crime uh, have we seen in the last year? We are holding pretty steady at what we saw a year ago. Um, what I can say is uh, I don't have the property crime numbers in front of me, but as far as shots, fired calls, homicides, and people shot uh, and stabbed, we're pretty much at the same levels on violent crime that we saw a year ago. I think we're maybe one or two incidents off. So that is holding, uh, the level of violent crime numbers seem to be holding uh, to where they were a year ago which has basically been on the rise for several years now. Another question I want to ask you is one of my clients, basically, uh, clients or constituents uh, basically reached out to me because he was concerned about, uh, he has noticed that there is an increase in guns uh, in the area. I'm just wondering, have you all uh, been able to, you know, uh, see that type of increase? Yeah, I would say that, I mean, that that's a, that, that's a, it's increased uh, across the nation. I think just in 2020 alone, there were 21 million new gun purchasers or 21 million new guns sold. So yeah, there's there's a lot of guns on the street and people are using. Uh, so particularly our criminal element. So again, our numbers have been on a rise last year, uh, 652 calls of shots fired that we answered, uh, almost 50 people shot, another 50 some people stabbed. So again, those numbers seem to be holding. So um, we're not we're not seeing a reduction at this point. Thank you. This is Kim. I wanted to add to um, what Sandra asked, and just comparing it to last year when we were almost completely in lockdown to now we're almost completely opened back up. It would help if we could look at it three or four years out to see if we can find those trends. Um, in comparing violent crime, property crime, et cetera. And we do, uh, Ms. Ronnie, we do have analysts that look at those numbers and project, but we also follow, you know, what's happening nationally. Sometimes we follow the national trends, sometimes we don't. That's, you know, any city would, would tell you the same thing, but in your major cities across the country, uh, Seattle, New York, I mean, they're seeing their homicide rates uh, I, I think in Seattle it was up like 800%. I had heard Chicago, obviously very bad, but here in Asheville, we're not seeing those type of increases. I mean, nowhere, nowhere near that. So uh, even though it's the number not, made a problem. So even though it's not in the presentation today, um, do you have that information for where we're tracking, say with 2018 or 2019? Yes. Yeah, we have, we, we always keep, uh, that data and, and under part one violent crime and so forth. And again, we've been on a steady increase for the last three or four years with that. So we do have those numbers. Well, and also, could you speak also to the increase at, for, as far as the illegal drug trafficking? And uh, what would you say the increase has been within the last year? 
or do you have an idea? Uh, that one I don't have uh, on drugs. What I can what I can tell you is our volume of arrests have gone down uh, because of the elimination of our drug suppression unit, and and we're not focusing on the low level drug crime, and again focusing more on the trafficking and distribution. So I think the numbers of arrests I can't. I'm kind of speaking off the top of my head, and and I could be wrong on this, but I think those numbers are down. Uh, and if they're not down, but the charges would be more serious. But I, I'm pretty sure they're they're down. I think most of our most of our drug arrests now come uh, in relation with with other crimes, uh, not necessarily you know targeting uh, something on drug distribution or street corner dealing, something like that. But we may arrest someone in possession of a firearm or with warrants, and there might be additional narcotics in the car that they get charged with but actively just, you know, working low level uh, street drug trade, we're not doing that at all. Thank you. This is Kim. So I had one last question, I think, for today. Um, and that is when we have nonviolent crime, say uh, property damage or graffiti, is it required or is it a policy that we send a sworn officer or is this another position that we might reimagine? I guess that's I guess that's always possible, uh, but again, we'd have to have some very high. I mean, if it's just the question of filing the report, we can do that online. I mean, the the, the key is the follow up investigation, not the actual taking of the report. So, sure, we could always send people out to take reports. We have people who walk in and file reports every day with our non sworn help, but we also have the online reporting tool, and I think really it's more of an education issue of advising the public that that option is available. But uh, re I, I know that is being tried in other cities, you know, to have people go out and take those reports. I don't see a, a major problem with that. Uh, it's really the, you know, the ability to follow up on the investigation. Our problem right now isn't taking reports. Our problem right now is can we investigate the reports that come in? They all get filed eventually, uh, but can we investigate and, and do the proper follow-up? And that is all I have. Um, I just have a comment. The, the summer months always bring more activity in our community. Um, so I can really appreciate how you all are looking at the JAG grant. Traditionally, it's been used to replace rifles. But it seems that this, um, in August, you'll be looking to apply the funds around community strategies and patrol. And I think this is what the community is looking for right now, um, taking our focus off of militarized enforcement to really have conversations with community members about what what does safety mean to you and what, what do you need and how we, how can we support you um, and how would the engagement best suit the community as a whole? So I just wanted to make that comment that I, I recognize that and I think it would be very helpful. Also, I would, I would like to say to the entire committee um, and all the staff who are listening, we are entering into um, the hot seasons, the summer months, and, and Ms. Campbell, I was going to have this conversation with you on tomorrow, but I would really like this time spent as a as a committee where you have three elected officials and we have robust staff to 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 kind of reformat our time together to make it a work group to to work through all of the things that we have in play um, concerning um, reimagining. Um, the reduction of, of our police staff, but still requiring, you know, coverage for areas, um, assisting our community in this transition from reporting every call um, to, to other systems that we have in play. I don't know exactly what it is, but we have a lot of things that can really help us shape 
a community safety uh, strategy, consolidating 911, looking at how we reorganize our relationship with Asheville Housing Authority and the the city school system. Um, I want to have, I want to, I want this to be more of a think tank in order to just do in business. Yes, we have to do business, but I think there is an opportunity here. Um, we have been criticized in times past, and it's it's a real criticism. It's a it's a real criticism that not too many elected officials are focused on public safety. Um, but again, you have three council members here. We're ready to do the work. Um, we're ready to push forward. So maybe there is a way that we can use this time. Um, it can be more productive. Absolutely. We will uh, do our best to see if we can structure a conversation around some of the um, challenges that we have as it relates to reimagine public safety and do it in a way that um, hopefully our discussion will be a discussion and not necessarily a final decision of, of, of course, that you know needs to take place with full council. But, um, but yes, absolutely, this can be an opportunity for us to think through uh, issues and concerns around uh, community safety. And uh, ironically, you, you named 911. Uh, a lot of work is going into that. And so we can provide you all with some status reports and see if you all have additional feedback that you want to provide us. Um, the conversations with the schools, uh, the, the chief and I had conversations with the uh, assistant superintendent just last week about uh, school resource officers and the role that police need to play. So there is there is a lot of of momentum and movement related to the reimagining things, uh, concepts that we got back, uh, input that we got from the community, um, and we have been doing them at a staffing level versus bringing all of that to to council for discussion. But we can certainly move in that direction. Yeah, I'm just a, a believer that change requires management and um, leadership, rather. Change requires leadership. So I wanted to put this out here in um, to the committee so that the committee can hear that this is direct, the direction I believe we should shift into um, because it is going to need um, this transition. It's going to need leadership and also a mouthpiece. And I think... Um, yeah, we, we, we need to get in the game because we're losing people and lives. Um, yeah, we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, now we have an update on the noise ordinance revision process and final recommendations. Ben is with us. Ben. Hey, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ben Woody. I'm the Director of Development Services, um, and I am going to move through a lot of material as quickly as I can, but there is there is some, I think, substantive information that I want to share, not just with the committee, um, but with the community as well. So um, before I dive into it, you, you are welcome to uh, ask me questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, you are also welcome to ask to, to stop me or pause me at any time to ask a question. So I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable either way that the committee wants to do that. So with that, I will dive in. Next slide, please. So this is um, this is a slide. These are the guiding principles. Uh, I know, uh, Chair Smith, you you've seen this slide a bunch of times, but we have always the staff. We developed this slide or these guiding principles when we started this process two years ago. Uh, I recognize Claire Richardson and Grania Miser who are on the call and have done this for two years with me, um, and we we have tried our best to abide by these principles. I just want to make a note that I think. Um, depending on your perspective on this topic, you may or may not think we've done that. But again, we have really tried to find balance um, throughout this process. And we've used these guiding principles for more than two years now. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned, we, we've been at this for, for a while. It's been two years. It didn't help that we had a pandemic right in the middle of it. So um, that certainly caused some delay. But we, we are in a position now where we're ready to we think the ordinance is close to final. We'd like to present some of those recommendations today. 
and hopefully keep moving this process forward. Because again, it's it's been a long time and I believe there are some tools in this new ordinance that will help us with our enforcement efforts. Next slide. Real quickly, just want to recognize this isn't hasn't been just a DSD uh, initiative. There's been a lot of partners within the city organization. I especially want to thank um, the Asheville Police Department and the Office of Equity and Inclusion for their help. Uh, they've been with us for the entire two years and, and they've been instrumental in helping us manage this project. Next slide, please. Um, the noise issues, we know what those are. We've kind of always known what those are. We have uh, significant uh, survey data that tells us this. We can look at the APD call of data, the nature of those complaints. So again, uh, you've seen this before. I just want the committee to kind of see what, what the top issues have been through the course of this process. Next slide. So here's where it gets challenging. So I think we've got a good ordinance. You saw that in January at that public safety update. Um, we are going to make some recommendations, some changes to that ordinance that you saw in January. But I'll say the bullets you see on the left, I think that generally represents where there's consensus in the community. It doesn't always feel like everybody's together, but there's we probably agree on a lot more than we don't at this point. Um, but I think everybody wants Asheville to be a special place. I think there's a, a lot of belief in community-based solutions, education, and just being transparent and straightforward in this program. But that doesn't mean, if you see the bullets on the right, there's still issues or areas that we do not have consensus on. Um, decibel levels, you've already heard some of that in the uh, comments section. I'm sure you'll hear more after this presentation. Um, the sound exceedance permitting, so the idea of if you're an outdoor music venue, and you just by nature have to exceed the decibel levels. You know, how do you do that? Um, there's a real desire in the community to have a noise advisory board. So some sort of public oversight that comes from both, um, I think, you know, music interests, business interests, resident interests. And finally, there's always a lot of concern about how the city does enforcement. So um, again, we've got some, some work to do and those may ultimately be decision points for the city council. Next slide, please. So one thing that we have, we started is, is for us, DSD, this started as an update to a noise ordinance, but I think what we've come to view this is, is actually building a program area for the city. Um, I think the ordinance in and of itself is just a piece of what the city should be doing with our, this program area. So we, we kind of look at this holistically. So we're going to talk a lot about the ordinance, but I just want to remind people that this all includes how we administer this program how we educate uh, our residents and businesses in, in Asheville, how we help people become better neighbors. You know, we always start at that, at that point, that place. Um, we wanna have clear expectations on how we enforce this ordinance moving forward. And of course we wanna you know, share information, be transparent, and then commit to reviewing the ordinance frequently. You know, we think every 18 months or two years, it could be different, but just to make sure, is it working like we've intended it to work? Is it having the outcomes that we expected it to have? So we want to commit to that. And we think all that together makes a noise control program. Next slide, please. One of the things that we um, that we did on this that was new for us and, has been, I think, was really informed some of the recommendations you'll see today is we worked with the equity office to use the GAIR racial equity toolkit. I know the committee members today are familiar with that. Um, our toolkit analysis is actually available on the website, so anybody can go look and see what that says. Um, but I think that helped us kind of understand, number one, to view the noise noise complaints as more of a pro programmatic issue and kind of the importance that, that all this has in terms of, you know, leveraging relationships, using education, giving people like fair access, people or businesses for that matter, excuse me, and then just making sure that we find ways to address these concerns before we result to any kind of punitive measures like a civil penalty. Um, and Claire, if you can click on the, the data, there's a link here to use data. Um, I think that should open up a spreadsheet if we can do that. Here we go. And I just want to take a second because one, a big part of what the city does is using data to make better decisions. And I just want to, if we can get it to open, share. Here we go. <clears throat> this reminds me a lot of what APD just showed you, but this is uh, Asheville Police Department call volume. I believe this represents calls, yep, from January of this year through April 15th. We're proposing to do probably, we haven't figured this out yet. Uh, Dan Lindley's on the call, so we're working with him on this, but probably regular data dumps where DSD can see this is dispatch call data. And of course, there's other ways to get complaints. But what it lets us do from an equity perspective is number one, understand how best to program our staff resources. 
Right now, uh, 90% of noise calls happen outside of DSD's business hours. So obviously we've got a challenge in terms of how we reprogram these new staff and the hours they work, but we're working on that. Um, we, we know, uh, like uh, Chair Smith said earlier, we know the summer is busier, we know the times, we know how to go find the noise issues and be more proactive once we get the staff in place to do this. Um, at the top of that page, you could actually, we know, you know, we know our busiest days. So um, at the top of the page, we can even see, or the first page, Claire, if you can go back up. And I, I don't do this to call out any business or any, any residential community. This is just an example of we can actually see where complaints are coming on. We can see heavy concentrations of the complaints. So rather than wait, you know, and, and kind of deal with those complaints incrementally one call at a time, we actually think we're in the position to proactively reach out to some of these areas and understand, well, what's the nature of the complaints? What's causing it? What can we do to solve this chronic noise issue um, proactively? So again, we think data plays a big, big tool. And some of these, as best we can, we're already trying to address some of these that we're seeing come into this with high call volume at the moment. Uh, so if we can go back to the presentation, Claire, thank you. And the next slide. And so that brings me to uh, what we want to talk about today really is we shared the draft ordinance. Um, we think most of that is, is in, in good shape and, and does what it needs to do. I'm going to talk about a couple of areas that we'd like to see some changes to and maybe answer some of the questions that we've heard from the community. So next slide. So first and foremost, and a caller reference to this, is how we handle noise in Asheville. We are proposing kind of a two-fold approach, and it matters where the noise comes from. If the noise comes, originates from a property in a commercial, central business, or industrial zoning district, so in other words, if noise originates in a non-residential zoning district, it is subject to an objective decibel standard. Um, we think that allows both the residents and the businesses to understand what they need to do to comply with the noise ordinance. If the noise originates in a residential district, a right of way or other public space, it is subject to a noise disturbance standard. That is a more subjective standard that I'll talk about in a second. Um, that's the way we we've, we've, are proposing to manage this program that's based on some of our equity work, some of our conversations with other jurisdictions and what we think is most successful for enforcement. I'll note real quickly, I just, I just spoke with Wilmington. They recently updated their noise ordinance and they're using both these standards citywide. So there's you know, different ways to do this based on the context that Asheville needs. Next slide. So let's talk about noise disturbance. So remember, this is the standard. We have this actually currently in place and it, and it has proved very difficult to enforce commercial noise, but we actually believe that applying the noise disturbance standard in public space, rights of ways and residential districts, again, that's when the noise originates in those districts. So this isn't noise from a business to a house. This is noise from residence to residence. Um, first, the important thing is, is that the noise disturbance gives you a little bit of flexibility, I would say, in enforcement. Volume in and of itself is not the sole determinant of a violation. If you have a decibel standard, all that matters is the decibel level. I think in residential context, in public space, I think there are other other determinants of a, of a noise disturbance beyond just volume. There can be duration, there can be the nature of the area, the time of the day, et cetera. So what we believe is a noise disturbance standard allows the enforcing staff to evaluate the unwanted, unwanted noise using different criteria. Now, volume is still a standard. So you see right there, number two, we can still take a meter, use that to help us assess and apply that standard, but we're not bound by the meter use for a noise disturbance standard. And probably the most important thing, and I think this really is important, when it applies residential to residential, so apartments, for example, is it allows the city to use context in determining whether or not a violation exists. So is it, is it a kid riding roller skates in the hallway? Or is it a party? What is the context of the violation? And, I, and I'll stop there, uh, Councilwoman Roney, and answer your question. So I know folks are watching this closely. We're talking about residential districts. As you mentioned, it could be um, apartments. How is this different than what we're already doing for residential areas? So this is the same standard that applies um, citywide. So this applies from residential to residential. Um, it is different in that context because we're going to approach it differently. And that goes back to the equity slide that I showed, which is we're gonna to try to work with, and I, have, I actually have an example later in the presentation where we're gonna walk folks through what that actually looks like. 
but I think we're going to approach this a little more proactively. Now, where this whole program is very different is right now the noise comes from a business. Um, we apply this standard. Well, this new program where the noise comes from a business, we'll apply the decibel standard. So I'm going to go to the next slide if that's okay. Okay. Um, so this is the other part of this, and this is where I, again, I want to take a second to walk through this. These are the decibel standards that we are proposing uh, in the current draft ordinance with a slight modification. And this is, again, this is noise or sound that originates in a commercial district. So these are going to be businesses. Um, what's really important, and I, I want to make this point really clearly, is on your own property, in your own building, in your backyard, if you're a business, you can be as loud as you want. There is no decibel level whatsoever on your own property. You can be as loud as you want for as long as you want. The decibel standard is, the standard here is, how loud can you be on somebody else's property? So remember, these decibel levels are measured at the receiving property. So what we're talking about is not how loud you can be on your property or in your venue or business, but how loud can you be on somebody else's property and how does that change with the different times of day, et cetera. So I just want to make sure that we're clear about, I think sometimes there's some confusion over that. Um, the other thing is, you know, from a business perspective, if you can calibrate your operations where you're, you're consistent with these decibels at your property line, then you know you never have anything to worry about in terms of a noise ordinance issue. So another thing is that's come up a lot, and I want to acknowledge this, is you know, there's some concern over the daytime. So we, we have set 10 p.m. Again, you can be, you can, the band or anything else can go on well beyond 10 p.m. It's just the decibel levels in this current draft lower at that time of night for other people's property. Um, that can be 11. A lot of places will, will make that 11 p.m. on Fridays and Saturdays. Some places even make it 12 p.m. on Fridays and Saturdays. We've also, we'll see an example in a second of places that make it 9 p.m. on weekdays. So that's really just whatever the community wants to see in terms of when should it begin to get quieter on other people's property. Um, another thing is we have, and Councilwoman Roney, you requested this, and in the agenda package, there's a pretty detailed list of what other cities are doing in terms of their noise ordinance. Um, we've benchmarks against, against these cities. Uh, we have had conversations with the enforcement staff in Raleigh, Charlotte, and Wilmington to understand why they made the decisions they made. Um, every city is unique in what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, the staff has taken more than, I mean, we have actually literally me, Claire, and Grania have went out and taken more than 70 individual decibel readings in Asheville. So we we feel pretty good about what the sound is in Asheville and the decibels that, that exist. I can't say we've measured everybody or we've caught every situation, but we have consistently made ourselves available to any party that would like us to come take decibel measures, measurements if they're concerned. Um, and last thing, and I got to hit on this real quickly, um, the CBD, you know, obviously we've had some calls on that, but another, another difficult, and just a difficult area in general is when you have businesses that are subject to a decibel standard and those businesses are located one in a dense area like downtown or two, on a, on a corridor uh, that adjoins residential, you have very difficult transition areas. So obviously, um, decibel, e decibel levels are much easier when the residential is not close to the business, but it is challenging um, in these transition areas. And that is one of the concerns that staff has with some of the nighttime decibel levels is we're concerned about applying those in situations where you have, for example, on Haywood Road, where businesses directly adjoin residential. And just to give some context of that, approximately 9% of the parcels zoned residential in the city, so about 9% of our residentially zoned parcels, abut a commercial, central business, or industrial zoning district. So those are those transition areas that are really difficult to deal with um, in this type of sound ordinance. Next slide, please. And I'll try to move a little faster. This is just an example of, of some other jurisdictions. Uh, one, count, one caller started to reference this earlier, but uh, some decide to measure it from the producer, some decide to measure it from the receiver. Um, either way works fine. Staff would only say that if whatever we decide to do, we need to calibrate the decibel levels appropriately based on where that measurement occurs. And I'll just let this sit for a second. You, there's a lot of variability in decibels. Every, everybody does it differently. And then that really is true. Next slide, please. Measurement's important, I, I talked about this. The proposal is to measure where the sound is received. 
Another thing I think I want to make sure everybody understands is not the max. Just because you hit 72 decibels one time doesn't mean you violate the ordinance. We have special meters that can do what's called a LEQ. So it'll run, it'll run the measurement for a minute and it averages it. So it's an average decibel level. It's not, not a one-time max. So that's how you apply that number. Um, next slide, please. This is this is um, not, not a big issue, but I do want to highlight this. One thing that we've really struggled with is trying to find a way that, in this case, after 10 p.m. or if it becomes 11, is we do have businesses that, that point speakers out their open windows and doors into the public space. So this was just an attempt to try to limit um, a business's ability to do that. You certainly can point your speakers in, inside your space. And again, you can make all the noise you want to in your, in your space, but this was just an attempt to have an easy way to actually prevent noise from being projected through windows intentionally in the public space. We've had a hard time getting consensus on this from residents and businesses. Next slide, please. This is, want to want to point this out real quick. You know, there, in the current ordinance, McCormick Field is completely exempt. Their fireworks are. We are proposing in this ordinance because we've, we've heard a lot about McCormick Field and, and we've worked with them on this to try to get some balance. Um, they are limited to fireworks on federal holidays. Outside of that, no more than 12 times a year. And this is for the tourists. They can do those on Friday and Saturday. No, they've committed to no later than 11.30 p.m. And the other piece is they've committed to testing an advanced notification system that will give no neighboring properties some, some advanced notice before the fireworks go off so you can be prepared for your sleeping baby, your dogs, or whatever it may be. So again, just want to make sure everybody knows the tourists are not exempt from the fireworks shows. Next slide, please. One thing we had in the original draft was the concept of a music venue permit that, did, that was poorly received. Um, it was proving difficult to enforce and manage. So we are dropping that. So if you are a music venue uh, or if you're a, a bar or a brewery that has music, you do not need a permit provided you meet the decibel levels in the ordinance. Next slide, please. But when you do need a permit, another area that I've just got to take a second um, to talk about is the concept of sound exceeding. So most, most cities, and again, this is in the information we shared per council woman Roney's request, most cities have some sort of allowance for businesses to exceed the base decibel levels. So that's not uncommon. It's It can be, some places do, Brad doesn't want to hear me say this, but some places do like a variance process. Those tend to be out west. Um, a lot of places have a special permit or exception or something like that. So this is just a working draft of how that could work here in Asheville. So again, there's no cap on the number of events you can have. You can have as many events as you want. The sound exceedance of permit applies when your events exceed the decibel level. So this is a, this is a framework for um, going outside of what the decibel levels would be. So one thing is Asheville's a great place. You know, there's a lot of nonprofit fundraisers. There's a lot of annual celebrations. So we think it's important to at least allow, and it could be more, but right now two events where any business can get a permit, and that's all it is, is a permit, which triggers an advanced notification. So you notify your neighbors, you have your party, exceed your decibel levels, your fundraiser, whatever it is. The second tier, perhaps, is businesses that do this more frequently. They, they have maybe several outdoor concerts a year. Um, same thing, they get a permit application, they provide a sound impact plan. Um, that impact plan doesn't require an acoustical professional. It's just a series of steps to make sure you're trying to manage your decibel levels, which could be as simple as, are you pointing your speaker at the neighbor's house or are you pointing it away from your neighbor's house? Just simple things like that that can help with sound that perhaps people don't always think about. The third tier, which, you know, which is geared towards um, performance centers. So this would apply to, to places in Asheville that are permitted to host outdoor concerts because generally outdoor concert is what's going to generate or tri trigger the decibel requirements. So the, these are places that are permitted that way. They were permitted that way through the zoning ordinance. They have a right to exist and have outdoor concerts. Um, in this particular case, if they're having more than nine shows up to 30, um, they would submit the permit annually. It can be one to cover all their events. They would have a professional sound impact plan. So they're going to hire an acoustical engineer to make sure they're managing their decibel levels in a comprehensive way. And they are permitted previously as a performance center. So this is a key part of their business. Um, that would be the largest tier in terms of sound exceedance permits. One thing that you'll see at the bottom, 
I would recommend that as part of this, the city take a look at how we allow performance centers. It, we basically allow outdoor performance centers in almost any commercial zoning district with very little standards. So that it is very easy to locate those with really no consideration of, of you know, their impact on residential areas. So that's probably something that's worth looking at as part of this ordinance. Next slide. And I'm almost done. I know it's a lot of information. Um, this is the penalties. I wanna be real clear. Um, these, these penalties, this concept of having a warning and a suspension and eventually a revocation, this only applies to sound exceedance permits. So this framework is one that lets us work, hopefully work with a venue that's getting a sound exceedance permit to make sure you know, they, they are mitigating that noise, make sure they're getting a permit, those types of things. Um, so really this doesn't apply to anybody else. So if any other business in Asheville ends up you know, the subject of a noise ordinance violation, they would just eventually be subject to a civil citation. This concept of revocation and suspension only applies to the sound exceedance permit. Next slide, please. So enforcements, I mentioned earlier um, that we're trying to work with APD to kind of kind of figure this out. This, you know, number one is us bringing on additional staff that work different hours and to help with this. Um, early in the earlier in the meeting, we talked about, you know, and I think uh, maybe Chair Smith mentioned this, but different ways to get complaints. So not every noise complaint has to go through the non-emergency line. There's lots of ways for us to know there's a noise issue. Um, we are working on building a some sort of online form or using the Asheville app to do that. I think that's a great way to let people um, bring complaints directly to DSD, especially things that really just don't need to have APD involved at all. And of course, the more we build capacity around noise enforcement, I think the more we can take APD out of that and kind of reduce the burden they have from helping us in after hours. Next slide. So three examples, and uh, then I'll be I'll be done. Um, example one is what does it look like uh, in a resident to resident noise? So remember, this is subject to the uh, noise disturbance standard. So the first thing um, is the good neighbor policy prompts the resident to go talk to your neighbor, or maybe you have a homeowners association, you can talk to them. If that's if that's safe, if people can do that, that's a great way to handle this. And a lot of times that can solve the problem. Um, maybe we don't always aren't aware of the noise we're putting on our neighbor. Um, I know there's times when that, that's not safe and that's not an option, but that's a great place to start. If the disturbance continues, then the resident submits a noise complaint. The first thing that DSD or APD does, depending on the type of complaint, is go assess the violation. You know, make contact, eventually assess the violation, make contact with a noise maker, make sure they understand what the ordinance is and how it applies and provide a verbal warning and then give the noise maker an opportunity to try to correct the noise issue. Because ultimately what we want is compliance and all this. Now, if, if, it, if at some extent that doesn't work, if we can't respond to the chronic residential noise issue, um, then, it, then, you, then you move into potentially things like civil citations or even contacting a landlord, or, and we would probably do this anyways, but trying to work with the landlord to solve the chronic issue. When I spoke with Raleigh, they gave examples of, you know, there's a kid on the second floor that likes to jump off the bed. Uh, they worked with the apartment complex manager and eventually moved that family down to a lower floor because that minimizes the noise. That's not always gonna work that way, but the resident to resident example is trying to work together to try to solve the problem if we can. Next slide, please. Business to resident is very similar. Um, same thing, it starts with a good neighbor policy. I've, I've always found in Nashville that almost always businesses are very approachable. So we're always gonna ask the neighbor or the HOA to contact the business first, because again, they, they don't know what they don't know. Um, if the disturbance continues, then we would ask they submit a noise complaint. Uh, DSD or APD would respond to assess if, and again, this is a decibel standard, so it's a little bit easier, to assess if there's actually a violation um, if there's a violation, we will follow up with a noisemaker with education and a verbal warning, help them understand what they can do to comply with the ordinance. Um, if, you know, if the violation, well, let me back up. So yeah, and in that is, and we've done this successfully with a few businesses in the past few months, is even with them discussing, well, how can we make this work? What are some mitigation options? Can we close our window? You know, can we reroute traffic through a different door? Um, things like that. Or could we apply for a sound exceedance permit because we only do this a few times a year? Um, if that doesn't work, eventually, you know, we'd have to move forward with issuing citations or contacting the business's landlord to try to get compliance. 
Um, if it does work, if we're able to, or if there's not a violation, then I think the city staff's proposing, um, we close the loop. We follow up with the resident and tell them that the business, in fact, is in compliance. And we made a determination there's not a violation there. So either way, at the end of this process is to try to deal with the noise issue if it exists and then close the loop with both parties. Next slide, please. This is, this is one that um, I, I know APD has, I know this is difficult for them as well, but we get a lot of complaints on loud vehicles. Um, that's an area that I still think APD has to be involved in. I'm not in a position or my staff is to go pull vehicles over. Um, there's a couple, there's a statute that applies to uh, a prohibition on vehicles with uh, modified mufflers or noise control systems. Of course, the noise ordinance um, applies. And what we're at, and this is just, I put this in here because it's just a big topic right now. What we're asking residents to do is to try to use the APD, tip to APD tool to submit information about the vehicle, the type of vehicle, the plate, if they can get it, and, you know, any information that can help determine um, or help us address that noise complaint from that particular vehicle. As we talked about early, APD will receive that tip and dispatch officers as available. Uh, next and last slide. So what we're, what we're proposing today um, is to continue moving forward with this ordinance um, update process and, and building this program. Um, we do believe that the ordinance effective date should be delayed. Um, there's no doubt that, that you know, we're at a difficult time right now as we recover from COVID. Um, we're still learning as staff. You know, this, this is new for us as well. It's new for the community. So we'd like to propose that um, we go ahead and consider the ordinance, adopt it, create a delayed effective date. During that delay period, you know, we're able to hire the positions that, that are being funded to help us with this. Um, we're able to, one thing that we are recommending is the inclusion of a noise advisory board that's important to the community. Go ahead and make those appointments, let the public be a part of this, what we're trying to do. Um, fine tune any objective decibel levels, make sure that the subjective standard and residential is working like we want it to. Um, bring that back to the council before the ordinance is effective, make any necessary changes, and hopefully uh, sometime next year have this in place and hopefully uh, enforcing it and, and making it work for the community. So that's all I have. I know that was a long presentation. I can answer any questions the committee has. Thank you. Hi, Ben. Uh, this is Sandra. And what I wanted to ask you about, I know you said that uh, you – uh, you checked around Asheville and you checked some of the decibel uh, around the area. Just wondering, what uh, when you were dealing with the buskers, what were you coming up with as far as decibel levels? So that's a really good question. Um, again, buskers are not in the building. Buskers are the highest. If, if, I could, if we're cataloging the readings, buskers are without a doubt the highest decibel producing things we've measured. Um, that's because they're outdoors. Um, usually within about 10 feet of a busker, you'll get between 68, 69, and we've gotten up to 90 before. Um, when we're about across the street, so about 30 feet, 25 feet, we tend to get 75 down to about 65. So we're finding the decibels across the street drop about 10, 10 decibels on average. And, and I'll, I'll say one thing. And it's not amplification. Like there are buskers that are amplified that we're measuring below 70 easily. And there are buskers that are not amplified that we're measuring at 80. So I do, I did notice that a lot of the people that were concerned uh, that were writing in or calling were concerned about that. How do you really regulate um, that? Um, what kind of, a, you know, tool that you use <laughs> so the first thing we've been going out on weekends and passing out brochures there's a there's a buskers collective in Asheville and they have a set of guidelines that they are supposed to abide by and most of them do so we've been out trying to educate early in the season um, I think once we get to the point that we have ongoing problems and we, and we do we have some that are just too loud um, I think you know at that point we're going to have to give them a formal warning and if they continue to do it we're going to have to issue civil citations we're still working with apd and legal on how exactly we, we do that because again we're not sworn police so we're approaching individuals um 
but I'll say that's why the noise disturbance standard is, is kind of interesting because obviously um, if you're at 80 decibels across the street, you're, you're too loud. That's a noise disturbance. That volume is too loud. But the other thing that's interesting is sometimes it's not the decibels that are the problem, but the fact that you're playing the drums and you're playing the same two songs and you haven't changed locations for eight hours. I would say that's an example where the duration is too much. Like I think we would approach that person not from a volume perspective, but remember from a duration perspective. Is that it's subjective? So there's, there's, you know, we've got to build, we've got to build our comfort level around applying those subjective measures. But, but I think it's a, a way to successfully manage busking noise. Okay, thank you. And to add to that subjective standard, is this um, enforcement going to be proactive, or is it entirely complaint driven, or is it a little bit of both? I think it's a little, a little bit of both. Um, the way we want it to be proactive is education first. I think we want to make sure, like, so the majority of our proactive um, approach will be to talk to people, to educate people, to make sure they understand, you know, the rules or the ordinances in the city of Asheville. Um, I will say this, Councilman Roney, if it's if somebody, if a busker's on downtown and we're out and, and they're, and I've done this, they're at 90 decibels, we're going to ask them to turn it down. So, I mean, but, but no, generally, like, our ability to staff this is primarily going to be reactive. Since we've been partnering with the Busker Collective on um, this engagement process, do they support the decibels as they're stated now? Well, remember the decibels, since the buskers primarily operate in public space, the decibels wouldn't apply to them. Um, I will say that I think, again, measurement's key. If we're measuring buskers at 10 or 15 feet, like, like some folks have asked us to do. And I don't think that's a bad thing, but the decibels are going to have to be pretty high for that. Okay. So um, first of all, I know you've been working on this so hard for the past two years and I've been following it really closely. I think, um, so first just gratitude, because I know you've been up to your eyeballs in this. Um, there were some things about your presentation that were new that I found interesting that I think we might want to address for public to digest. Do we know why Charlotte went with the DBC instead of the DBA measurement? I do because the majority of their complaints is from like bass music. So mus music that has high levels of, of bass um, is what generates the majority of their complaints. So that, that's why they did that change. Okay. Um, and we also have other partners who've been um, reviewing this and working together um, we've done probably the most extensive community engagement effort I've ever known us to do as an organization following these conversations for years, um, which I thought was something to um, be really, you know, proud of. We've used the new GEAR program tools um, when folks weren't um, submitting information via survey. We went and found them in their neighborhoods because the neighborhoods were a big issue. Um, so. I am a little concerned because of the amount of comments that we're getting um, from the actual music professionals. Um, does Is there an opportunity for us to go back to the drawing board where we had AMP and the Coalition of Asheville Neighborhoods working on uh, consensus together on the decibel levels? The, there is. I mean, there's always there's always an opportunity to refine this and, and make it work for us because that's what we want to do. I mean, honestly, we'd love. I'd love to get consensus. Um, I don't know that they'll ever get complete census, consensus on decibel levels. I, I think some of that they're just a part on. Um, but yes, the, if the public safety committee asks us um, to circle back to that group, we, we would willingly and, and happily do that. I think it would be wise because, like, right now. We know because of the Asheville Area um, Arts Council's research that the city of Asheville has um, 200, or I guess Buncombe County has 200 nonprofits, 500 art organizations, and the city of Asheville had pre-COVID 7,312 creative jobs. I'm reading this off the report. And um, $1.4 billion in industry sales. So this is not only like a multi-generational industry, it has... Um, minority women-owned businesses. Um, these are the things that we say we want to support local businesses. And a lot of these folks weren't eligible for stimulus funding. So 
this is hitting right after the pandemic where we're still needing creative solutions um, for seeing a recovery. And we said we wanted to have an equitable recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. So I just, I personally have read and responded to 415 emails. And I started out counting music professionals and then business owners. And then because I'm a music professional, I was reminded that all of these musicians are also small businesses and entrepreneurs. So um, I just think this is maybe the wrong time to not go back and check with our partners, especially because we need an equitable recovery. Um, so personally, I would like to see us go back and and check in with the Coalition of Asheville Neighborhoods, AMP, and the Busters Collective. Um, but I'm also in a different area concerned about vehicle noise because through this process, I thought there was an, also an equity issue with the cost of vehicle maintenance. And I'm surprised that we're pursuing this, that we have the capacity for that enforcement um, and that we made the switch. So did something change in the process where we decided to add vehicle noise at this last minute? No, I, no, it, it didn't. And I just added that as just an example because we we get I get a tremendous amount of emails about vehicle noise. Um, and, and I guess I don't want to speak for the, the chief. I'm going to try to a little bit, but um, they don't have capacity right now. So I, I think any any enforcement from them is, is going to be a real challenge. Um, I, I will say, though, in my observation, there are vehicles in downtown that, that do kind of make a make a, a circuit, a cycle, and, and sometimes they are they're very loud. They, they really are. But um, I guess to try to be responsive, we added that last slide in there. And again, as I said, I, I wouldn't be also be upfront with people that I don't have a civilian staff. I'm not sure that we are in a position to try to pull a vehicle operator over. So again, that does fall that does fall back to APD. Well, I was happy to see that in there because I've been downtown. Uh, sometimes I'm down there a lot, and I've noticed that, especially on the weekends, uh, the, some of the vehicles are so loud. It, it, it's, you know, it's so annoying that, you know, we just say we're just going to leave, especially in that center part of downtown. And it's almost like it's become a, the thing to do, you know, with some of the kids, you know, <laughs> or whatever. So I'm glad they are cracking down on that. And I think it's definitely something um, we should do. So one of the things I didn't see in this this last presentation as we're expected to make a recommendation is that like sort of a heat map for where the most complaints are coming from. Because I know when we've been reviewing it over the past couple of years, both in the public and now officially, is that the, the complaints are mostly stagnant. They're, or they're, they're staying the same level. Um, but it was neighborhoods that we were seeing getting the most complaints. That's that's correct, uh, Councilman Roney. The the number one the number one area for complaints is downtown, without a doubt. Downtown is far and away the epicenter of noise complaints. But then the next four census block groups that generate you know the highest amount of complaints are primarily residential and primarily apartment complexes and things of that nature. So really. Um, the bulk of the complaints and, and where our energy really needs to be as a city is probably working in those residential communities to try to find creative solutions to address those noise issues. Although we find ourselves talking a lot about uh, music venues and, and residents, but that's not actually where the, most of the complaints exist. When I mean, we had the big event at AB Tech and I sat around the table with the West Asheville neighbors, they were like, we are so sick of the sound of development. We're so sick of the sound of dogs barking. We're so sick of the sound of traffic. And so when we had, what, 1,500 survey input offered, and I thought music was ninth. But it is getting the, a lot of attention right now, and I think that's because of this. Um, this it's an industry that's in recovery mode. So I think we are going to have to look really carefully at that if we say we want an equitable recovery. Because... You know, let's say that my my friend decides they want to play the same pop diva tunes on the sidewalk over and over again for an hour is going to get a different level of complaint than someone who's, say, listening to hip hop, electronic music or metal. Yes, and the, and the noise disturbance standard is going to sound is content neutral. So, yeah, it, should, it really shouldn't matter the type of music you play. Um, Yes. So it right. is complaint driven. It is, it is, we do get a lot of complaints. Yeah. 
So my, I guess my question that we can look as a, as a group here, do we, do we make our recommendations and bring it back after we have even more input because we've been doing this for so long um, to ensure that we don't have this negative impact on, um, this, on our music and culture industry? Um, or can we like ease into it and increase our decibel levels and see if that's even something that we have the capacity to enforce? And, and if, if I could, uh, this is Deborah. I, th I think certainly staff will do what you all direct us to do at the committee level. And obviously, uh, it will be council's decision. Um, but I wonder if we could specifically hone in on what is the the biggest concern is it is it actually the decibel levels because once staff goes out and we reinitiate conversations then essentially we are opening up almost an entire the, the ordinance the noise ordinance in its entirety so is there a specific issue that you're asking staff to pursue uh versus let's relook at the the entire ordinance. And I think what staff also was suggesting is um, certainly we wanted to go out, <clears throat> excuse me, and do a little testing, do a test drive of these standards uh, for at least about six months. That's why we're recommending that the effective date be delayed or deferred. Um, and uh, hopefully, the community sees that as a result of the conversations that we've had over the past two years, that we have made significant adjustments to uh, to these standards. We've tried to uh, be uh, good listeners and try to, as one of the uh, guiding principles, and it may not have been a guiding principles, but it was early on in the presentation related to, to balance. Uh, we are trying to balance the um, the economic development impacts, uh, the health impacts. The it, it is a complicated thing to to manage, and I think you will see that a lot of these communities. I was actually in Charlotte when we uh, drafted uh, the changes to the the most current uh, noise ordinance. Um, it, it, it's um, it's iterative. You know, you, you do something, you see how it impacts, and then you go and you make a, additional changes because you've gotten either this uh, uh, somewhat uh, of, of a concern from the community that we've gone too far or we haven't gone far enough. And so I would, I would just ask that if we could, if we don't want to move forward, if we could narrow it down, if we're going to go out and have additional public input, what specifically are we seeking from the public? Well, I can only speak for myself, but if we can go back to that slides with the different cities, I want something to fight for. I want our small businesses to bounce back. I want this industry to stabilize and continue to grow. We're on the national stage. Um, folks are moving here because of our um, culture. And it's not just music, it's also performance. So when I look at this and I consider what I'm hearing from our partners, Extended hours and higher decibel levels, something similar to a combination of Charlotte and Wilmington, and then seeing if we can even do that and then get a report back is something I feel like I could say yes to. But right now I can't. Okay, so Kim, you stated two different directions before you um, made the comment. You said that um, you wanted to reopen the conversation and my understanding is that you don't want to open it up across the board but with the specific compromise that was established by can and amp is that correct right so long as we have partners that are at the table together finding solutions i think that's a that's a an attitude and an approach that we want to foster so if we have an if it's if it's possible that we can do that and bring this back next month and see if we can you know get some professionals. We have a lot of 
uh, engineering professionals in our community and a lot of connections, then that could be one option. Not the whole thing, this part. So you're saying that as a committee, we can move forward, move this forward to full council pending that com that conversation. And then the, the, the compromise or whatever re uh, results from that conversation will be presented um, at the full council level. Or I mean, no. We could we could do that. I'm I'm not going to be able to support it with the decibel levels that we. And can we go back and look at ours? Because I, I agree that I do I do agree that in the downtown area, um, the decibel levels that we have stated do seem below average yeah. to me. And I think without ampl ampl amplification as being stated and without turning your speakers outdoors, I think so much of what Asheville has attempted to create in forming this lively downtown area, I believe that just on a standard without any extras, I mean, we're going to have a substantial level or what some people find as a substantial level of noise but I, I don't I don't see that the levels that we have right now are at the disturbance level or at the public health concern level, if that makes sense. So um, I also just don't think we can enforce this. Well, we don't have yeah, I, would, I would like to say a uh, sort of maybe I was thinking because like uh, Ben was saying this, there will be sort of like a trial period, you know, to see, you know, the outcome where you'll come back and revisit, you know, uh, things that we can change. But I do like the idea of maybe uh, starting out with the, like Kim said, with the levels of Wilmington, uh, uh, North Carolina, sort of those levels, practicing that and that way and coming back to revisit after that. And the reason I say that, because even with the, uh, 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 the can and the amps or whatever, from looking at the what they were concerned about, I think by going up a little bit higher to the Wilmington level, I think we've addressed a lot of the issues that they were uh, concerned about. So I'm thinking by doing it that way and then going back to revisit it to see, you know, making the adjustments, that way um, you're giving the people in the community, especially a lot of the entrepreneurs and the people that make their money this way, especially during the period of, you know, what we've been through. I think that would be a better way to address the issue right now rather than going out there being too strict at a time where we actually need to sort of uh, uh, embrace the economy to get it moving. I agree, Sandra. And I guess the only thing that I would just add, and, and we heard this from some of the earlier speakers, is don't forget our central business district is also where people live. And uh, so we just have, have to re remember when we talk about increasing the decibel levels, um, there's a little bit of there's a little bit of tension there. Now, now Deborah, if you if you do do something like that. And as far as the hours that they can actually, you know, tweak the hours that it can operate, uh, do you think that would help? Uh, because I think that's really what it's all about sometimes. It's, it's the hours. Um, because I used to live downtown Miami and basically, you know, you can imagine what that was like. But the thing is, but I found out like it's safer it's in the morning uh, with the construction or whatever, but they would come at a certain time. And just by making it an hour later, like they were talking about the track, it made a big difference. So maybe we can tweak it uh, as far as the, you know, the timing or, or that we actually do. And then maybe that would help, you know, a lot. So what do you think about that? Uh, I'll, I'll definitely defer to, uh, to, to, to Ben and, and Claire. Uh, but I think just so that we're certain about the next steps is... You want us, you want staff to go out and convene a group and it's only the group that you recommended just can and um, the business group or uh, Ms. Ronnie, how, how well, big a net the two do that you I'm aware of have been in conversation with each other and that's what I would like to foster. We, we talk about good neighbor policies and then they're modeling it and then we should support that. As long as our partners and our neighbors are coming together and doing that, Let's let's say yes to that. 
um, and then see if they can provide some input on these decibel levels. Now, only thing, Kim, if, if we start doing that, like you said, with these groups, then, then what do we look like if the other groups want to start participating? And then we feel like we're just sort of, you know, catering to this group because they came together. So I think you're sort of opening up a whole can of worms as to where you can go. And sure. I, it, you sure. know, and, and you know, and that's okay. But I'm just saying, why don't we exact as far as trying to get something on the table that we can work with? You know, why can't we work with if they did do a slight increase on the decibel, and then we and like I said, the can and the amps, pretty much from what I'm reading, that would sort of you know address some of the issues that they had. That way, we have something to work with, a base to keep it moving, rather than going back to the table and all these other people coming in, which is going to delay the process even more. I think it's a both and. I think we can raise the decibel levels as a suggestion. I'm happy to make that motion um, that are, i just trying to think really clearly, it's 75 for daytime, 70 for nighttime between 10 and 2, something along those Wilmington levels. I, that, I would be willing to make a motion, support, then we move it forward, and then we circle back with and what was that you said? Oh, what was it? The, Walmi the Wilmington, 75 oh, DBA. Yeah, I said, I'm, fine. I'm okay with yeah. that. I think that especially at this particular time where we're trying to get the economy going, I think we need to be somewhat lenient to get it up and moving. And then and we the curfew yeah. hours. Yes. That's something I can support while we circle back to double check and see if we can get some support for this. I mean, we're not going to please all the people all the time, but. Okay. Is there a motion? A motion to recommend the um, noise ordinance with the um, changes to match the Wilmington, North Carolina daytime, nighttime, and curfew recommendations to the full council. And also to revisit it in six months for, you know, an open for discussion or something like that, you think, Kim? If we had to sure. Okay. I'll second. Okay, with a motion and a second, I'll do a roll call vote. Councilwoman Kilgore? Aye. Councilwoman Roney? Aye. And myself, aye. The motion carries. Thank you, Ben, for all your hard work. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I'll see you all again soon. <laughs> all right, the last agenda item is an update on the revised alarm ordinance. And Mr. Limley is here to present this, this item. Good evening, uh, Vice Mayor Smith and Council Persons Kilgore and Roney and Manager Campbell. Appreciate the uh, opportunity to present this proposed revised alarm ordinance. Um, if you want to look at it, in one sense, the letter of the law regulates um, the alarms, whether we're talking about permits, applications, the the devices, the user responses, false alarms, the review of false alarms, uh, service charges, uh, which are the civil penalties and the allowable devices that the users use. But then there's a second sense, it's the spirit of the law. And I think this is what I would like to focus upon under this new alarm ordinance is designed to reduce the number of excessive false alarms that uh, really unduly burdens the limited resources of the Asheville Police Department. Next slide. As you can see here, um, under the current ordinance, when we talk about the letter of the law, there are civil penalties. This is the current ordinance. Uh, there's requirements for alarm users. Uh, there's fee schedules and, and so forth. And one of the things you look at is the civil penalties. Uh, no, ha Not having a permit, there's one warning, and then $100 for each response of the police department and so forth that you see here in a graduated format. And there's always the aspect of due process for the, uh, the alarm user, appeals and hearings, what we do. So when you look at the spirit of the law, which uh, we uh, want to look at, next slide, it's to reduce the number of false alarms. And here's a graph for 2018 to uh, year to date 2021. If you look at that, the average false alarm rate is 97%. And if you can look at that graphic, which is uh, pictorial there, the legitimate alarms are a very small fraction of what Asheville Police Department responds to. Next slide. So when we talk about the spirit of law to reduce 
alarms. Uh, going off of the Security Industry Alarm Coalition, they recommended some key points, and these are uh, some of the points that we uh, look at to develop the alarm ordinance. We looked at the model ordinance, uh, registration guidelines, a graduated fine structure, new equipment standards, suspension of the uh, response to chronic abusers, and an in-house outsourced billing and tracking component. However, what is uh, when I went to the alarm conferences, what is the, the industry's best practice in reducing false alarms is what they call enhanced call verification for the alarm companies. This is basically the alarm company uh, having second or multiple call procedures uh, to verify the alarm. So currently, some will do this, but the majority of them don't. Once they get the alarm, they call the Asheville Police Department Communication Center, and a call is built in sending an officer. Under the enhanced call verification, which is a second verification, the alarm company has to verify the alarm. And in this case, they've seen a stand, across the standard 40% decrease in false alarms. And in fact, there was one jurisdiction that actually saw their false alarm rate go below 20%. Next slide. So in the proposed change in ordinance, there's going to be, uh, if you compare the, uh, the old with the new, there were some supplementary definition of terms. The idea of now causing the, uh, the uh, alarm user to pay for a permit and then renew the permit. Enhanced call verification. Added prohibitions to reduce the fault alarm. The new fee schedule and duty of alarm companies. And if you look over in the uh, bottom right-hand side of the... Uh, changes, there's the fee schedule. The current alarm ordinance does not have this, so the new fee schedule is what will be in the new revised alarm ordinance. And then under the section 1341 of the alarm ordinance, there is again the enhanced call confirmation, which reduces the false alarms. So to review, next slide. <clears throat> With 97% of both residential and business alarms being false since 2018, which unnecessarily drains police resources, if we look to the spirit of the law, what this ordinance is supposed to do is to reduce the false alarms by 40% or even more. It's using best practices of the model ordinance, even recommended by the alarm uh, uh, coalition, and ultimately the redirect the limited police resources with the ultimate cost savings for the city of Asheville. Though this ideal ordinance is for any time, I, I would say that now is the time with the public's interest, especially of reimagining policing, to revise the alarm ordinance. And to uh, you, the committee, if approved by you, this ordinance will be then presented to the Asheville City Council. Our hope is on the first reading on June 22nd. 2021. Any questions? All right, thank you. Um, with no questions, is there a motion to move the revised alarm ordinance forward to council for its first reading on June 22nd? So moved, Sandra. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Second. <laughs> All right, do a roll call vote for approval. Councilwoman Kilgore? Aye. Councilwoman Roney? Aye. And myself? Aye. Um, and the motion carries. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate you. you have a good evening. All right. Um, now we're to the end. <laughs> we have public comment. Staff, is there anybody in the speaker queue? And I would like to remind, if so, um, I take it that there are people there. Please state your name and where you reside. You'll be given three minutes. Um, and this section, this section of public comment will be held up to 30 minutes um, for our, yeah. Jenna. Okay, I'll bring in the first caller um, and I will let you know when we've reached 30 minutes or we've gotten to the last caller.
Caller ending in 2266, your line is open. Hello, Grant Millen, longtime Asheville resident. You all can hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead, Grant. So I can't fit the HIDSA high intensity drug trafficking area issues and my there is no street illicit sentinel solutions report template or model out there. If you just explain to me the need, the unmet need there that you guys are thinking, Kim just said, I'm thinking about 1980s war on drugs universe about these serious issues. And the Biden-Harris administration isn't back there in the 1980s. Their new Office of Drug Control Policy um, director is a woman who seems to share a lot of your and my thoughts about what reimagining law enforcement is about, harm reduction and so forth. It's not General, McCa uh, General um, McCafferty in the, in the 90s. We had a four-star general in charge of that, 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 that war on drugs. But it is a, um, it's very serious. It's, you're talking about transnational organized crime. I didn't hear even Chief Zach or, or the, the uh, HITA um, executive talk about uh, transnational organized crime. It just it doesn't seem like, the, like we have the understanding to get going um, with, with real public safety there. Um, but I'll return to these matters in the future. Um, I like Kim Roney as a, uh, as a person, but she can't be on city council because she can't defend us. Uh, I was in the military. I'm an honorably, honorably discharged veteran. And I just didn't hear, I haven't heard anything letting me know that she can execute the oath that she um, made when she got elected. She got elected. Fair and square, um, given, even given the small numbers that go out to vote for city elections. And Vice Mayor Smith, you're, you're kind of, you sound pretty weak too, to be honest, on maintaining public safety as we, as we search for the political strategy, policy innovations, and resources for a more, more equitable society. If this council and city manager can't come up, come up with an effective noise control strategy, you will dang sure won't have what it takes to put the brakes on street fentanyl or get APD operations to functional levels. The downtown motorcycles are easy. It, it, it's kind of hard. You'll get a whole, you'll get this big movement from motorcyclists saying, stop punishing us. But that, that's so easy when you get- Well, are you you all, there you go. all done. Caller ending in 7629, your line is open. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hey, my name is Grace Martinez. I'm a West Asheville resident. Um, and I was just really encouraged um, by the conversation that I heard surrounding the noise ordinance. Um, I, I feel like the theme that I've heard throughout this meeting um, really makes me think about power um, and the folks who who seem to be able to wield it really easily in our community. Um, when I looked at the, the information about the noise ordinance, I saw that property values were a concern. And um, I'm also a local real estate agent. Property values are a concern for me because there aren't people in my community who can afford housing, um, not because I'm worried that music that makes my community really vibrant um, is going to decrease um, any wealthy downtown condo owners' um, uh, property values. But um, as far as the the grant that you all just approved, um, I would encourage you to remove the $276,000 of funding from the police budget in other formats. Um, that serves to increase our police budget um, when we're at a time where we're working to, quote unquote, reimagine public safety, which I think means a reduction in police. And um, I feel like the reason why, you know, I, I feel like a lot of people who don't understand um, or people who are thinking the way I do think is that, like, I do care about 
safety in my community. And I just don't think that that the police are able to adequately address the substance use problems that we have in our community, the wealth disparity that we have in our community, the housing shortage that we have in our community, the lack of resources for, for mental health, for folks with disabilities. Um, and I really feel like, you know, with, with this opportunity we have, as so many police have left the department, we can hire other professionals to start to handle these things um, instead of, you know, also dealing with catering to things like noise complaints, where it's oftentimes, um, you know, the same complainers who are calling the police. It happens in my community all the time. And I've witnessed it firsthand um, at Ben's tune up when a, a man called uh, in a noise complaint and proceeded to come down and scream in the face of the manager and wag his finger and try to wield his power over her. Um, and so I just, I just really, I appreciate the work that you guys are doing. I'm really seeing a shift happening. And I hope that we can, you know, shift where our budget is um, and, you know, start to address some of the underlying causes of the so-called crime in our community, because it's definitely something that I am very concerned about that I, you know, witness every day in my community um, that we just saw with the tragedy over uh, this past weekend at Westville Pub. The, the problem is that I don't think we're actually three doing minutes. anything. Thanks. Caller ending in 2231, your line is open. Hello, my name is Jessica Thomason. I am the co-founder of Asheville Music Professionals. I am a 23 year resident of Asheville and I've lived and worked downtown for all of, or I've, I'm sorry, I've worked downtown for all of those 23 years. I, for the last 15 years, have made all of my income from music. I have been involved in the, these negotiations and discussions with the city and with the Coalition of Asheville Neighbors. And I want to say, first and foremost, we do want to be good neighbors, and we've been doing our best to come to a, a middle ground. And quite honestly, right before last week, I thought we were really there, as were a number of other people that were in on that conversation from the music industry. Um, I will say that I think that some of this information is getting misconstrued in terms of the numbers of the World Health Organization, in terms of what constitutes noise that's detrimental to people, because I could easily look up OSHA's permissible exposure time to, to noise and 90 decibel limits is, is what they consider. I don't say that in terms of the fact of wanting decibel levels to be 90 decibels. I'm just talking about using information that's adequate and, and, and correct. And so we have been doing our due diligence from the music industry side of getting decibel levels, readings at close to residences. We've gone to the baseball game and we're closely working together with a team of engineers that have over a hundred years of experience to put that information out to the general public and you know, for the city as well. And so I say that because it's not necessarily easy information to understand, right? So again, you know, I read all of the comments that people had written in from the meeting that was supposed to happen last week. And what I surmise is that the people who live downtown, it's loud. I know it's loud. I, I, I work downtown. I hear it all the time. And I think when I look at the fact that they're frustrated with, with construction, with car noise, with drunk people, what it seems like they can control is music. And I get that and I understand that of wanting to have some basis of some control, but they act as if we're doing music for 12 hours a day. And if we're talking about measuring decibel levels, you know, a jackhammer or a power drill is at 130 decibel levels, uh, DBA. So just to put that in perspective, I can understand if you're listening to that all day for eight hours a day, the last thing you want at the end of the day is to hear music. But that doesn't really work when we're trying to be a music city. Um, the music industry, we, we are all entrepreneurs and uh, you know, we want, we want a noise ordinance. We want to be considered a legitimate music city. And for that, we need to have a noise ordinance, but we have to have something that works for all. So I just want to say thanks to all of you today. I appreciate where you've come to with your decision right. and um, work. Thanks. Ending in 
Kim, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I just had to turn off that 100 dBA machine I've been working on for 10 hours. My name is Jose. In terms of equity, not assume everybody has a residence. I'm one of the uh, thousands of homeless people uh, working homeless here in Asheville. Uh, I've been here two weeks. Kim, hang in there. It's like Kafka. I've been on this for two hours as I've been working, and it's surreal, surreal to listen to this. Uh, surreal to think that uh, semi-educated people uh, can make comments like Biden wasn't a part of the 80s and 90s drug war. Um, yeah, just go do a quick Google search for Biden, 80s, 90s drug war. <laughs> You'll get plenty of data. Uh, yeah, I've been here uh, three weeks. Uh, I got trespassed out of an empty parking lot on Tunnel Road. Two officers were able to come and be dispatched there um, just for sitting in the back of my truck having a coffee. Uh, but the landlord, the owner of the property, not, the, not any of the actual tenants uh, doing business there, just the landlord uh, was just driving around and trespassed me. I was then at a Planned Parenthood uh, counter protesting. Uh, some good Christian folk out front. Three officers were able to respond to that. There was no crime. Uh, they, the three cars came. They came in five minutes. Um, you know, this double speak from the chief. This, all of this. It's, it's madness. It's madness. I don't. Please put this energy you put into noise ordinances, into real public safety, harm reduction, needle exchange, <laughs> Narcan training. Like, you can do it. This community can do it. But do we care about public safety? Like, what are, what are we doing? What do words mean anymore? And, and why are we still giving more and more money to the police and sending detectives making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year out on patrol. 50% reduction in detectives, 30-something percent deduction in officers, and no change in crime, good. Cut their budget in half. That's all the justification you need. Like, if I stick around, maybe I'll get on council. But <laughs> I've been on councils before. I've been on school boards before. And it is uh, Sisyphean task. So, anyway, thank you, Kim, for doing it. And we got your back. Caller ending in 4404. Your line is open. Hi, my name is Libby DeCayetani. I want to talk about Section 1088 that's entitled permitting. Uh, the noise ordinance, I've Lived downtown for over a dozen years, and I love its vibrancy, but I've got a serious problem that this section introduces the concept of private outdoor live music venues to the CBD. In the efforts to revitalize downtown, the city has sponsored many live music events that have become part of the much-loved fabric of downtown, and I've been delighted to be a part of that fabric, but... Note that these are public, not-for-profit events and that they have all supported the music industry and musicians in Asheville. But there's been no open discussion about whether private, for-profit, outdoor amplified music events would be good for downtown and for the city. Very few folks I've spoken with about this new concept have been aware of its existence as part of the proposed noise ordinance. Unless I'm somehow mistaken, this section makes it possible for bars and restaurants all over downtown to host private events with loudspeaker towers set up on their patios. And I don't think folks really grasp what it would mean to have the potential for 85 decibel concerts running for up to 20, 12 hours a day from multiple venues throughout the CBD. This aspect of the noise ordinance would essentially privatize public space. While music has always been a core part of the Asheville area, the music that's been played outdoors has been a part of the public domain. And sure, outdoor music has included street musicians and restaurant musicians and 
front porch players, but generally and historically that music has been unamplified and usually done by individuals or very small groups. The new concept of private, for-profit, loudly amplified music as a part of downtown is not a part of our tradition. It's a wholly new concept and would alter downtown in enormous ways. If we want to abandon the idea of downtown as a well-knit community of workers, performers, creatives, together with the full-time residents that make it feel like something more than a tourist trap, then start the weekly, daily, and potentially overlapping private, outdoor, amplified music. You can be sure that Julian Price would be shedding tears. If that happens, I'll be gone, and so will many other people who want to call downtown Asheville their home. The apartments will become just so many more hotel rooms, and downtown will lose the very character that brings in the tourist dollars that pay for musicians to perform. The citizens of Asheville need more time so they can be made aware of this totally new concept, as well as an opportunity to discuss how it might affect the city we want to live in. I volunteered at Beer Fest and... Okay, thanks. Caller ending in 2136, your line is open. Hi, my name is Liz Talent and I am an Asheville resident and an Asheville native, um, a music professional, um, a mother of three young children and a board member on the Asheville Area Arts Council. Um, I do want to address the commenter who spoke great right before me just to say um, there are several uh, rightfully zoned and permitted outdoor and indoor performance venues in Asheville, both in the CBD and in other uh, commercial corridors. And those are, uh, you know, approved in the UDO and the exceedance permit that's in the ordinance would not allow more than one or two events per year unless the applicant um, made lots of good faith efforts to show that they are putting on professional events, show sound mitigation, and so on and so forth. So um, just want everyone to understand, this does not mean that every restaurant in town is going to put up speaker towers and do ticketed concerts. Um, that's not how it is written, if folks want to take another look at it. Um, Kim, I want to thank you for being a voice for the music industry and for the arts and for our musicians, um, such a huge part of our of our culture here. Um, I know myself and lots of other folks have been working on this for uh, well over a year. And um, I will echo what Jessica said that I felt like we had already reached a consensus and had lots of negotiation and compromise. And um, as a music community, we had willingly accepted um, limitations such as how many events per year we can do, uh, a reasonable 85 decibels, which is, by the way, um, you know, probably 20 to 30 decibels quieter than an indoor concert would be um, at the residential unit's property line. So that's not inside their condo, that's outside at their property line, um, which is an important distinction. Um, and also, you know, we had accepted curfews, which, you know, not, not to say that I don't also love and appreciate our minor league baseball culture here, but, you know, the tourists in McCormick Stadium had no such limits and could play games 129th year if they wanted to. And we were all willing to accept 30 events a year. So I feel like what we had already agreed to uh, was a compromise. And, you know, many of us have put in hours and weeks and months of work um, to try to protect our music scene, which is really the crown jewel of of North Carolina. Um, I've been working really closely with NEVA this year, the National Independent Venue Association to save the music industry, which has been, you know, the hardest hit in the pandemic. And I can tell you that what we have in Asheville well, is really the envy of the country. So I, I thank you, Kim, for your advocacy. We're ending in 9286. Your line is open. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. John Roberts, City of Asheville. We all listened as Chief Zach told his sob story about APD staffing levels and response times. 
But the truth is this mass exodus of officers did not happen in a vacuum. The fact is that there are droves of officers leaving in force due to large part to the fact that last summer they came face to face with the anger and contempt that many citizens have for them. Also, many cops are finally starting to understand that they will be held accountable for their brutality by being legally prosecuted. In fact, I would reason that a substantial amount of the recent attrition was from officers who left to avoid accountability for the role they played in last summer's brutalizing of citizens. Some of them might have just grown a conscience. The reality of all this is that the community has clearly and repeatedly demanded that APD be defunded and that those monies be put towards alternatives to policing that could better produce outcomes of true public safety. But in all that defunding conversation, the truth of the matter is the biggest win that the defund movement had was thanks in large part to the city manager and the mayor who forced the chief of police to come out on video and apologize for the brutality that he laid out on our citizens. I'm sure that broke the thin blue line in half. So at the end of the day, we want less cops, not more. I don't think y'all have totally grasped that yet, but there will be political consequences for the members of council and for those of city staff who fail to understand how serious we are about eliminating police brutality from the city of Asheville. Have a good day. That was our final caller. All right, um, any more comments from committee or staff? All right, having none, um, we'll adjourn today's meeting. Bye.